right, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, so the first um, item is to review and approve the agenda. Well, there, there is some logistics. That's number two, but I will talk about those, I think, in a little bit. Uh, so do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Does anybody know about adjustments to be made? Uh, Jack. There was the one thing that <coughs> I was thinking we should take off the consent agenda. We can talk the about that when we get to the consent okay. agenda. Okay. Great. And and then the other thing, it looked like the way the agenda was printed that there were there was redundancy of two items. The USDA mm -hmm. item. Yeah. Um, is it's it, not, is that not right? Mute. I guess I don't need. Anyway, um, yeah. So there there are two same. We have to have a formal public hearing, so I had to be warned that way. But it's really all one item. Okay. So. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Any other changes to the agenda? All right. Uh, all right, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so we are gonna move on to uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, if you have an item or a comment to make on an item that is on our agenda, we typically take those up uh, adjacent to that agenda, so you, um, you'll have a chance to say that when it becomes, uh, when it comes up in the agenda. Uh, if you're going to make a comment, if you'd say your name, where you live, and try to keep your comments to two minutes, that would be excellent. Donna over here is going to help us with timing, so she'll hold up something at one minute, and at two minutes, I'll let you know to stop. Um, and please keep your comments uh, if, if you do make comments about an agenda item, keep them germane to the topic. Um, and I think that is it. That's all I want to say for now. Uh, all right, general business and appearances. Yes. City yeah, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, today, the city released a statement about an incident related to potential violence at Montpelier schools. Um, first of all, I'd like to commend the police department for their swift action in this and taking uh, address. Secondly, I think there's been some fair criticism uh, levied as to the timing of our, our release of information. And I'd just like to say, you know, there's never a good time. The event was, uh, the matter was under investigation. There's no evidence of an actual crime being committed. It's not illegal to have guns in your home. Um, there are things that people can say, especially not during school hours, that may not rise to the level of what Vermont statutes call criminal threat. And the matter's under active investigation. Um, so finally, we decided today that we should release it. I think we could have released it earlier. There was no real reason. And if people are upset by that, I, I take responsibility and apologize. Um, uh, you know, the school handled it their own way, and I'm not going to speak for them. But from the city and the police department's end, uh, we only want the safety of our kids and the community. And um, He's certainly happy to meet this head on, and I suspect we'll have further information released tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna probably speak a little bit more about that when we get to uh, our item about uh, gun violence, the gun violence proclamation, uh, which is coming up. Uh, but other comments, yes. Sorry, but also we'll take people in person first and then we'll go to folks who are with us digitally. Hi, I'm Linda Berger and I live in District 1. On the agenda tonight are discussions of the Vactor dump station, the USDA funding for the water resource recovery facility, and the water resource recovery facility odor update. These three agenda items address the Council's strategic goal of improving public health and safety. The primary focus of the facility's phase one upgrade was making the plant a net zero facility, thus supporting the city's goal of practicing good environmental stewardship. The focus for the city broadened to include air quality on 11-5-2021 with receipt of a notice of alleged violation of air pollution control regulations from the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. I think I'm under two minutes. <laughs> the notice required corrective actions. Recent concerns over leachate caused the council to pay attention to the health and safety impacts of water discharged from the plant. The phase two odor control infrastructure work at the facility will not begin until summer 2023. It will not be completed until fall 2024. 
I appreciate that the council is attending to the health and safety impacts of the facility on Montpelier residents, and I urge the city to fund a short-term air quality fix while waiting for the phase two project to be completed. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And we'll talk further about that when we, when we get there. Um, further comments, yes. I just have a, a question, maybe Bill could probably answer it. Um, I think it was in the bridge that uh, they're saying that the marijuana dispensary is gonna be the first retail sales store in Vermont. Is that true? I read it somewhere, so that's why I'm here to ask. Is this true? I don't, so is what, is it, it, it is true that it's going to be, that it is seeking to become a retail sales store. I yeah. don't know whether it will be the first in Vermont. It probably will, I think it will be the first in Montpelier. I didn't. Well, the thing was, is if it was gonna be first, I was wondering if we could put a city 5% tax on it and use that, you know, like you do for restaurants, use that to fund the, the homeless committee instead so, of putting a $400,000 um, item on the ballot is that how you say it okay you know how we voted on that but if we had like a five percent because I'll tell you if that's going to be the first one you're going to get people from all over the state up here buying and if we got had a five well it's, it's true if you ever uh, heard of that Eddie Topper beer remember people were coming from out of state for it you know people from Burlington would be here you know, and if we could get a 5% to fund that, you know, get everybody else to pay for it instead of the citizens here. It, I don't know, can you do that? Yeah, I, I can chime in there. Um, I, I did take the tour of the dispensary. Yeah. And uh, from my understanding, you know, th there'd be four, maybe they would have the potential of opening yeah. uh, as, as early as right now, nobody's ready. I think this one may be slated to go July and the rest may not go until October. So it could very well be the first retail dispensary in the state. In the state. Now the yeah. problem is, I like, I like how you're, th you're thinking, but, yeah, um, the, 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 yeah, but the statute limits us to only collecting what we do currently uh, for, the, for the use tax, which the is like 1%. Gonna, the state's gonna so, get half so, of it. Tom, so it's gonna bring us to so, that. So we can't, <laughs> we, we, we can't go above what the state statute allows us to, unfortunately, but we can lobby for it. Tom, do you have anything further? Huh? Anything further? Um, uh, do I have time? One question, you know how the big talk on uh, the water bills and everything here. <clears throat> I'm just curious, how come on your property tax bill there's also another charge on there for, for water? It makes it like five water payments, not one, uh, not four. But I don't understand why that's there if we have water bills every quarter. So there's a water and sewer benefit charge as well as a CSO benefit charge. And those were basically due to federal orders that the city was required to comply with. And so those have benefit to all uh, residents, uh, whether they are on the water or sewer systems themselves. It's been authorized by the legislature to do this. And um, it's been in place for even predating me. Uh, one of the benefits of it is that uh, non-taxable entities such as the state, churches and things, nonprofits also pay that. Uh, so uh -huh. any, anybody does that. Um, so it is slightly separate. It's not really a property tax. It's a sewer and water and CSO benefit charge. So do state, so does the state and uh, nonprofits also have a water bill for a quarter yes. water bill? They do. Huh? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Be before you sit down. Um, I know most people here know who you are, but would you identify yourself oh, so that people watching can know who you are also? Thomas Moore, District 3, Prospect Street. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. So first I'm going to protest the two-minute constraint because when it's unfair to the public to have to bring things up two months, two years, and uh, still have y'all not take action on them. And so for me to have to repeat them coming out of my two minutes is uh, grossly unjust, and your two minute limit won't hold up in court. Uh, you really discourage public participation while you pretend that you encourage it. It's, it's lip service, it's disingenuous, and you need to address that. 
it's not worth taking photos if everybody just passes it by without even taking a look at it. There's lots of photos that would evidence what I bring forward. We've got a fire escape, a third floor fire escape that's been blocked by a Christmas tree still in the stand for six months now. You know, where is our building inspector? Where's our fire inspector? Um, so this has gone from incompetence to corruption and y'all are complicit in it when you allow these repeated issues of missing public records and lying police officers and stealing police officers to, and you don't put them on the agenda for examination. You don't hire professionals to dig into and verify who's telling the truth. You're afraid to expose the lies your city manager dispenses. So you really need to realize that you've crossed the line into corruption. You're running a corrupt little city here and it's, it's unfair to all of us. So we, two weeks ago, I mentioned the trash buildup uh, over on the, the uh, bike path <clears throat> and it's still there, it's worse. The poor people there are spending their beer money to buy garbage bags to try to pick up after themselves and we can't even give them the dignity of having our garbage contractor pick it up. Uh, people are defecating over there and urinating but the defecation is really the hazard. That's a health hazard and it's partially because the city is not enforcing it's, you're, you're looking for my time to be up, huh? Uh, it's partially because the city is not enforcing its lease to keep the bathrooms open and or taking over that lease and keeping the bathrooms open consistently. Uh, you push things through on the consent agenda like the police contract, like the city manager's contract, denying the public an opportunity to expose the corruption of Bill Frazier amending his own contract to protect his golden parachute even if he's convicted of a crime you know, and, and that's just corrupt. You're buying into that corruption. So uh, today we had two, we approved the public works contract. Today we had two uh, public employees sitting in an air conditioned truck with it idling, watching paint dry, okay? And how is that with your, go with your net zero, you know, uh, goals? They could have easily, if it weren't for that union contract, had one person supervise the drying paint while the other two went down and painted another crosswalk. So Steve, you're at three minutes now. I'm gonna ask you to wrap up your comments. Uh, I made public records requests that came due yesterday. It still still did not respond. Uh, appeals to the head of the agency. This this guy is, his sovereign impunity d d thinks he can just say, oh, sorry, that's on me. I can ignore the law. And it's up to you to hold him accountable and or get a professional or an attorney to abide by public records law. Otherwise, y'all are scoff laws. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thanks for cutting me off, because I know yeah, you hey, care so, so much I've, about I, me. So you're, you're done talking, we thank do you. You do not need to interrupt me. Steve, you minutes. are, um, I, I'm gonna call you out of order for talking back to me and talking out of turn. Um, if, I, if you speak out of order again, I'm gonna ask you to leave. So let's just be clear, that's your warning. Thank you. Um, with regard to the uh, garbage cleanup, uh, I think it's a good point that that shouldn't be left to uh, lie out there. Um, so could we ask the Department of Public Works to look at that? We did and we have, and to Mr. Whitaker's credit, he actually called in earlier today and let us know this would be coming up. Um, they're gonna be out there tomorrow to get those, and we did get the ones last time, it's just built up again. Um, and with regard to the, to the public records request that was just um, referenced, um, he's right, we're a day late. I actually wrote to him and said, I'm sorry, we're a day late. It was his, his request for public rec, all public records of anyone telling people not to talk to him, which we highly likely do not exist at all. However, rather than just check, we've decided to check all through the police department just to make sure some corporal didn't tell some police Sergeant, hey, you don't have to talk to that guy. So we're going the extra mile. I acknowledge that we were late, apologized to him, told him we'd get him. I don't know what else we can do. Okay. And it's a very frivolous request, I might add. Anyone else in person? Okay, I know we have a couple folks with us digitally. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Elaine Ball, go ahead. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Elaine Ball. I live in Montpelier and I wanted to bring this up during general business because I haven't had the time to attend a council meeting before now. I moved here in August and since last June I've been planning Montpelier Pride 2022. So I just wanted to bring it to the council's agenda that Montpelier Pride will be taking place uh, not this weekend but the following, the first weekend in June. And there will be a festival on the State House lawn on Saturday, June 4th from noon to 5. We're very, very excited that Toussaint St. Negritude will be our MC for the event, and there will be many nonprofits and local government agencies um, tabling and sharing resources and information with the community. If you'd like to learn more about the events happening all weekend, you can visit pridecenterbt.org. And if anyone would like to volunteer, we still need volunteers. Um, you can email me at elaineballvt at gmail.com. Really quick, I also, I'll send this in an email, but I would love to request that Mayor Ann Watson, if you would be willing, um, that you could possibly declare Declare the month of June Pride Month in the city of Montpelier. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you. Um, just checking the um, item E on our consent agenda. Um, we will be flying the, the Pride flag <clears throat> during the month of June, but I would be delighted to uh, declare uh, June uh, Pride Month, um, and so uh, let's let's work together to get some like an, an actual um, proclamation together, and we can have that on the the next uh, agenda item or the next uh, the next uh, meeting, and it might what's today this is the, we're at the end of may so that might be in june is that okay right definitely if it's sometime in june that's fine i realize my request is <laughs> a little late <laughs> that's okay let's let's make it happen thank you thank you yeah okay we'll go now to peter kelman go ahead We cannot hear you yet. You're still muted. If you want to... Okay. Am I muted now? Yes, we can hear you now. That was tough. <laughs> um, Peter Kelman, uh, Mountain View Street, uh, Montpelier. Uh, at the end of uh, last uh, city council meeting, during which the council voted 4-2 to remove the Gwerton structure from its Main Street location and place it in storage, uh, council persons Bate and Harrell both urged that concrete goals, actions, and self-imposed deadlines be set to address the unmet needs of unhoused members of our community. Yet, I note with sadness and concern that not a single item on tonight's agenda appears to address these needs unless perhaps We'll hear something about them toward the end of the meeting uh, from other business or the city manager's report or city council's report. Specifically, it would be comforting to hear that one, the restroom committee, which was created last June, has at last scheduled a uh, meeting. Two, that lockers have been ordered and a date set for their installation. That was approved at the last meeting. Three, that steps have been taken to appropriately publicize the availability of showers at the rec center. This was mentioned by Councillor Bate, um, and that perhaps the arrangements have been made with some charities to make available towels and toiletries. Uh, fourth, that a concrete plan be underway to provide a cool uh, and inviting space in, sit in public buildings, in particular City Hall, including on weekends, because we don't know when the heat's going to hit. It could hit on, on weekends. Uh, and number five, that the Homelessness Task Force has met and will soon make concrete recommendations for all sorts of matters. And finally, that a more, uh, but particularly that a more permanent way, per more permanent ways are to uh, 
in, in being recommended to address the cold weather sheltering issues and longer term issues related to um, homelessness. Uh, I hope we're gonna be hearing about these things later in this meeting and in every meeting from now until forever. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else with us digitally wish to make a comment? You can unmute yourself uh, or turn your camera on and wave. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone, so we are going to move on then. All right, so we are on to the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I move that we <coughs> remove <coughs> item G from the consent agenda and uh, pass the remainder of the consent agenda. I'll second. And there's a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Jack. I had one question about uh, <coughs> item E, the pride flag display request. I, I recall there was an issue with the flagpoles and whether we can fly a different flag because it's t the, the flagpole at, in front of the manager's office is taller than the other one. So we address that with our flag policy. It will actually fly on the flag below the American. We'll take down the city flag and, and sh fly the, the pride flag for the month, the same that we did with the Black Lives Matter flag for that month, and then re put the city flag back at the end of the month. Great, thanks. <coughs> Any other questions or comments on the consent agenda? Okay, uh, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, and I think uh, it would make sense for us, uh, I'd like to take it up just right now, if we could. Um, so let's take up uh, item G. I will ask. Deputy Public Works Director Kurt Monica to address this. Hello. Hello. I'm Kurt Monica, Deputy Director, City Engineer, Department of Public Works. Um, so I'd explain a little bit about uh, what the um, vector dump station is is intended for. So the city has a, uh, a jetter truck. We call it our vector truck. Um, we use it to clean the sewer mains in the city, and. Um, in addition, so it uses high pressure water to pull um, debris out of the sewer main and then it um, pulls it through a suction tube into the tank of the truck. And right now, um, the only way that we have to deal with um, the waste in that truck is to dump it in a 40 yard roll off at the wastewater plant. Um, and then we have to eventually bring that roll off to the landfill once it's full. And there's a number of challenges with that. Um, often it will spill. Um, and this, lo this roll-off is located at the wastewater plant, and all the storm system goes into the influent. So it's not a water quality issue per se, but uh, it is an operational issue in that um, in order to bring it to the landfill, we have to decant the water. So any rainwater that comes during um, you know, the cleaning process of the sewer lines, that has to be pulled off the top of the dumpster uh, with the vector truck again, bled into the wastewater plant until we can get you know as many as much of it uh, solids as we can to bring to the landfill. Uh, so the proposal is um, to construct um, a concrete um, concrete walls and a slab with a drain that goes directly into <coughs> the influent of the pipe. So the material we're cleaning out of the sewers is essentially domestic wastewater, so residential sewage. And that's exactly what is in, you know, in the pipe that comes into the plant. So there's no change um, to um, the waste stream that is gonna be entering the plant as a result of constructing this vector dump station. Um, but it would eliminate this roll off, which takes you know, hours and hours of staff time um, to manage, to decant the water, to fill, to clean up spills. Um, so there's a, a major operational savings. It'll, it'll save us a lot of time in order to um, improve efficiencies with cleaning the sewer mains. But in addition to that, um, I, I feel it will reduce odors from the plant. Um, so instead of having this big open tank, you know, that's full of sewage sitting out in the yard, it's gonna go, any time we clean the pipes, it'll then go 
straight into the plant influent where all, all the other residential sewage comes, get treated immediately and go through the process of the plant. So there's an operational benefit. Savings will be able to clean more sewer lines with less staff time. We'll also be eliminating this, um, you know, this, uh, this tank full of sewage that kind of sits in the yard um, and the cost of disposal. So no longer, we will no longer have to truck and pay Casella and the trucking company to dispose of um, these solids. So there's a lot of benefits to it. It's really important to us. We've been working on it for about a year and a half. Um, so I'd ask that you um, consider approving that. Any other questions that the council has? Or the public, go ahead. Yeah, it, yeah if you would come up and use the uh, microphone. I'm just wondering what the additional gallons um, per week would be, would you anticipate that are going to go into the waste treatment plant? Um, I think it's going to be a relatively low number, so we, you know, we need to clean the sewer pipes regardless. Um, we may be able to do a, uh, you know, an extra, you know, 50,000 gallons a week because we're more efficient. But again, this is um, residential wastewater, so it's, you know, it's the same, uh, the same um, characteristics of the waste that's coming into the plant now. Um, and we're eliminating it, um, you know, sort of sitting untreated on site. So there may be some in small increase because we're more efficient, but um, you'll, you're eliminating this um, open vessel of, of wastewater on site. Okay. Um, so, Linda, if you have more questions, if you could ask them all together well, and I then. Answered, I, I, have, I didn't understand something. Yeah, so go ahead and, but from here again. Okay, okay. thank you. Yes. If I'm understanding, um, there'll be an additional, instead of it being outside, it's going to go inside the plant, which it hasn't done before. Is that correct or a misunderstanding? Um, so the solids will go through the plant, which were historically trucked oh. through, the, through the landfill. Okay. Um, until they go through the treatment process, we still pull the solids out through okay. the treatment plant, and they eventually go to the landfill. Okay. Um, it'll just be sort of a different path. But the liquids have al always gone into the plant, so there's no additional liquids going into the plant? Um, it, other than, uh, inc you know, our efficiency getting a little better and, and maybe cleaning more sewer lines than we do now because we're under cleaning, mm -hmm. um, you know, a small increase in liquids potentially, but uh, it's a very small amount. Okay. And a lot of it is water that we use to actually clean the pipes, so it's not actually wastewater. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Okay, is there a motion? Oh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, just related to this, there were some other questions that we passed on to you from Linda. Are we going to be? Are you answering those directly to her, or is there is it going to be brought up later on, if not covered now? Yep. So I have a, a presentation planned as um, part of the. <laughs> Part of tonight's meeting, um, I mean, my thought was I would do it, uh, answer those questions at the end of end of that presentation. Perfect. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, is there a motion? Jack, I, I move that we approve uh, item G, the uh, <coughs> vector pad and and walls proposal. Okay, motion and second. Further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank I you. I appreciate anything you do to reduce odor. <laughs> this is really important. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we have a couple of proclamations um, to make. The first item is uh, both related to uh, baseball. So we have the Bud Fowler Proclamation and the James Lee Cat Proclamation. I don't know if anyone's here to represent um, either the Mountaineers um, with us digitally or in person that wants to speak to that. I'm not seeing anyone. Um, I do think it's probably worth mentioning um, the Bud Fowler uh, proclamation. Very cool. Bud Fowler um, was uh, the first black professional ball player um, in America. So very cool and great to uh, be recognizing him. And then James Lee Catt. Uh, recognizing him for uh, his uh, support of our hometown team and uh, well-deserved election to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. 
Um, any, uh, is there a motion regarding that? I move we approve both of these resolutions. I think it's a great thing. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, um, the next is a proclamation declaring first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And when we put this item on the agenda, uh, the shooting in Buffalo had happened, but uh, the shooting in Uvalde had not. And it just seems, it's just heartbreaking that this is so relevant. And uh, I am just even personally frustrated, um, angry about the situation um, there. And, I, and in Buffalo, in Uvalde, and in all of the, the places that have experienced um, mass shootings, uh, gosh, since, since they existed. And uh, if you are feeling similarly, I would encourage you to get in touch with your legislators and let them know that uh, where we're at with gun legislation is not sufficient, that we need to have uh, better uh, gun laws in Vermont. Um, Besides that, we're also declaring uh, the first Friday in June, June 3rd, um, National Gun Violence Awareness Day and to wear orange uh, to recognize that. Um, anything other folks would like to say about that? I actually, before we do um, a vote, I would actually like to have a moment of silence. Um, but, but let's, if you have comments, let's do that now. Public comments? Yeah, go for it. Connor Casey uh, wearing my Gun Sense Vermont hat here. Um, I'm going to recuse myself from this vote just because I helped draft the proclamation. Um, obviously, this was drafted before the like two horrific mass shootings um, in the last week here. And uh, you know, I, I think the information we had today shows that you know Buffalo, uh, the supermarket could be Shaw's. Um, you know the uh, Rob Elementary School. That could be that could be any of our schools here in Vermont. So it's easy to say like it happens in other places, but you know gun violence happens everywhere. We have 80 Vermonters a year who lose their lives from gun violence here. Um, and you know it's it's one thing to spike the football if we pass a few good bills or something, but it really needs to be a culture change in our gun obsessed country. 110 Americans die every day. Hundreds more are wounded here. Um, and I think just, you know, the thoughts and prayers, uh, this proclamation is good, but it's not worth the paper it's written on unless we have, like, meaningful action that backs that up uh, more than we've ever done before here. And really, like, you know, every level of government has a part to play. Um, you know, there's a lot of cowardice being shown in D.C. right now. Um, what we passed was wildly insufficient to the State House this year as far as closing the Charleston loophole. Um, and I learned, and some of the other um, gun safety advocates learned, was we have in statute uh, what's called the Sportsman's Bill of Rights that pretty much pre preclude municipalities from passing any ordinances around guns. Uh, Burlington found this out, you know, when they tried to expand their extreme risk protection order. So what Gun Sense is going to be doing over the next few months is engaging municipalities to contact the State House and say repeal the Sportsman's Bill of Rights. Who else has a Bill of Rights like this, that they're immune uh, from having communities pass something that directly impacts their health and safety here? Um, so again, like, I think the best we can do is proclamations like this. And I really want to thank uh, Moms Demand Action, the other group in, in Vermont who's really taking the lead on this. Um, but again, the words are meaningless unless we back it up afterwards. So thanks very much. Thank you. Steve Whitaker, I think that uh, I'm supportive of the proclamation that we need better gun control, but let's not lose sight of the fact that we've had one person killed by a bad guy in Montpelier and two people killed by our police. And it was an error of our own system of not looking at the dispatch record for a mentally distressed person before we allowed one of our officers to put two fragmentation rounds from a safe distance where he was at no risk of the pellet pistol in his hand. So gun violence happens both by the good guys and the bad guys, and we have swept it under the rug, especially with Mayor, your 
uh, not noticing the public hearing and holding it at seventh on the agenda at the following meeting and calling that all the community healing that was needed. That was a farce. Hey, thank you. Any further, uh, further comment? Okay, I think from the council and nothing online. All right, if, oh yes, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really glad this is on the agenda. I know it's been a really hard day for me and for many of us and my heart just goes out to these communities, these families who are suffering so much, um, our school staff and our children here in Montpelier and across the country I know I held my 11 and seven year old extra tight. Um, I know there are also a lot of great resources on processing this grief, talking to children. I'm happy to send some to the city. I don't know if there's some place to post those, but unfortunately, because we've been through this so many times, there's a lot of you know, really helpful resources out there. So I'll be happy to, to share those in case we can make those available to people in the community um, and just you know echo that we need federal action, we need state action, contact your legislators, you know, we need to grieve, but we also need to act, and there's so much more we can do to have stronger gun safety legislation, so um, I hope this can at least translate into some better laws to protect more children and more lives across our country. Thanks. Um, yeah, I agree. I also want to um note that the city does have a social worker and so you know as people are processing the last week uh the last 24 hours um if you need to talk with someone that we do have um a city uh, social worker who is available to everyone um so everyone is welcome to get in touch um with our, our social worker um uh, and so if uh, any other further comments um, if you um, would, I would just like to take um, just a few moments here in a moment of silence um, just to remember uh, the, the victims from um, Evaldi, Buffalo, and uh, around the country. Thank you. All right, uh, is there a motion regarding the proclamation? I move we adopt the proclamation. Second. Okay, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, and, and you're abstaining, yep. Thank you. All right. And so now we're moving on to an appointment to the Capital Complex Commission um, uh, with the application of Tim Center, who I do not see online, nor do I see here in person with us. Um, is there a motion? Yes, Jack. I move we appoint uh, Tim Center to be the city representative to the Capital uh, Complex Commission. Okay. And I'll second that. Okay. There's a motion and a second. I also have a question. Yes, go ahead. In all my years at City Council, I don't remember this coming up. Oh, really? And I, at one point, when I was in public transit, was a member <laughs> on this commission. And it was very active at one point. And I don't remember any reports from anybody. So can you give me some backup uh, background? Thank you, Phil. Sure. So the, the city has one rep on the Capital Complex Commission. The rest are appointed by the governor. And um, for a long time, it was someone from the Planning Commission, and then they lost interest. So for, for a very long period of time, Paul Carnahan was our representative. Mm -hmm. And then he recently stepped down, and then Mr. Center has stepped up. Um, you know, typically, they re their only real job, they're essentially design review for the Capital Complex. Our, our design review doesn't extend into the capital complex district so they perform that function and look over buildings and projects and that kind of thing so i, I don't know that there would be an, a report to us per se as much as they react to proposals and things that either bgs puts forward or somebody 
who owns a home within the district and wants to do something. You know, if someone has a, if you own a home in the district and you want to change your porch, you've got to go to them instead of our design review district. So. Well, I guess I'm looking at them as one way to help them reduce their parking lots and likewise perhaps to work with us on some issues because that's when I was on when we were dealing with the first time uh, before Taylor Street multi-center uh, transportation center was it was going to be dealing with some state parking issues city issues and so it came through that commission so there were there was a city state commission that had a slightly different um, focus so that was specifically to deal with buildings and transportation and parking in the capital complex and there were four representatives from the city and four from the state and I think maybe someone from transit yeah. which may have been you can we, yeah, can we use this a little bit more like that I'm just well, trying to have well, a so th this is established by statute uh, and it really its duties and responsibilities are pretty clear the city state commission at some point expired it was also set up by statute and it expired it was um, so uh, and, but the whole one Taylor project did go through that city state commission and was blessed by them and approved by them as well as the city the, the capital district master plan that we still refer to but it was different than this, this yeah. capital yeah. complex commission. I, 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 underst I understand that I'm glad you gave me the two different titles because I forgot what the other one was named I, I guess I would hope that maybe, because I look at parking and I look at bathrooms, and I'd like to have a place where we could have it, somebody always there talking about it and inserting it, not just going to the building's um, administration. That's all. Yeah. Fair enough. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you for making those two. The, an additional one is regional communications. I attended a, one of the meetings of this commission uh, and one of the senators made a point that the Capitol Police communications needed to be integrated in with the regional Central Vermont Public Safety Communications planning. And y'all have subverted that, but that's still, the, f the fact that this person, all their personal details are blacked out and there's no exemption claimed, uh, it makes it hard. If he's supposedly representing me on this commission, I should be able to reach him. So I don't understand why you blacked out all his contact information uh, on the application. Uh, but accountability and transparency is key here, as is the opportunity to vet this person for their views on public restrooms and, and radio communications, et cetera. So, uh, so to be clear, this, this commission has nothing to do with any of those. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Is there a motion? Oh, there is a motion on the table um, for the discussion. Okay, and not seeing anyone online. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, so we are up to the USDA. Uh, grant public hearing, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing, but I think I'm also probably um, inviting uh, Kurt back up to the table, I imagine. Right, <laughs> yes. Well, yes. Kurt's coming up. I'll just say that the, the grant public hearing is a requirement and then uh, for the funding, and then we also uh, wanted to provide you a project update, as was due, and, and Ms. Berger had also requested um, some information so we'll try to address all of those uh or and, and by we i mean kurt uh, <laughs> we'll try to address all of these through their presentation and i'm we're i'm sort of assuming that this is a combination of nine and ten yes on the agenda okay what did you do i was gonna do a powerpoint presentation okay where's your powerpoint <clears throat> sees it from over there, I will be shocked. It usually kind of...
Okay. Um, Kurt Monica, uh, Deputy Director of Public Works. And um, this is the public presentation for the Water Resource Recovery Facility Phase 2 project and the East State Street Reconstruction Project. Um, this is a requirement for USDA funding that we conduct a public hearing. And um, I'm also going to take the opportunity to provide some updates uh, on where we're at with these two projects. Um, and so I will jump right into it. So the items that we'll be covering tonight is the biosolids drying project at the water resource recovery facility, uh, the benefits of the two projects, other plant upgrades that are planned, preliminary cost estimates, um, uh, an update on the odor, uh, status of the odor control at the plant, and an update on uh, where we're at with the East State Street reconstruction project. So for the uh, biosolids drying, um, when we last, when I last uh, spoke with council, we were uh, moving in the direction of an indirect hot water belt dryer. Um, so a belt dryer, there's, uh, there's two um, paths of waste at the plant. The first is the liquid stream, and the second is the solid stream. Um, this is specific to the solid stream, so um, you know we separate the, the solids from the liquids as they come into the plant, um, both through the pipeline, the collection system, as well as hauled waste is truck to the plant. And um, the, the goal of this, the intent of this project is to reduce disposal costs associated with those solids. Currently they all, uh, all the solids from the plant go to the landfill. Um, so as I, I mentioned earlier, um, uh, we, had, we were looking at initially a, a hot water um, uh, belt dryer, which is um, basically utilizing methane, um, heating up a hot water loop, and then um, running that hot water uh, through sort of this, uh, can I associate it like a pizza oven, but it really um, uh, uh, de uses dehumidification to dry the solids. And uh, some of the benefits of that process is that um, you can run it unstaffed and um, it would utilize the methane through uh, hot water boilers. Um, it, this technology has been around for a long time, so it has a proven history. And um, once it goes through this process, you have what's called a Class A biosolid, which, um, which means all the pathogens in the solids have been destroyed. Uh, the new development, this is the update, is that um, our uh, consulting engineer uh, asked if we would be interested in, in evaluating gasification as an alternative to the hot water uh, belt dryer. And this has some you know, very exciting benefits. Um, uh, the first is that the fuel source actually uses um, the solids, uh, the waste material, um, and it burns it, and that's kind of what uh, is, is used to heat this unit. Um, so instead of methane, uh, we would use the methane sort of to start um, the process, but once it starts going, uh, you're able to actually use the solids for the heating source. Uh, it has a, a little bit higher maintenance than the belt dryer, um, but it's still relatively low. Uh, compared to some other technologies, uh, like paralysis, which is a, a something else we took a high level look at. Um, but it does need to have uh, uh, staffed operations while it's running. Um, it's, it's relatively new compared to the belt dryer. Um, and really sort of the biggest, most exciting component of this is that it has the ability to uh, destroy PFAS and PFOA um, down to levels um, what's classified as what they're classifying as total destruction of two parts per billion um, which is really kind of the level of which it can be accurately uh, measured um, and so this product also has a further reduction of solids disposal over the belt dryer um, and you can um, use it to create a bio biochar material so it's a another step up from a class a material it has a, a higher value um, less uh, concern with environmental impacts. Uh, this is a, an overall site layout. Um, the red on the left is where yeah, either one of these equipment um, would be installed. Um, um, we would need conveyance uh, conveyors to move the material uh, back to our uh, what we call the garage building um, in order to uh, haul the waste. 
and just kind of high level economics of these two alternatives. Um, uh, there, there is maintenance downtime, so that first line is uh, when we're not able to operate this ma this uh, machinery or this equipment, um, you, it will be um, you know, just dewatered. So it just um, goes to our, our what we call our screw presses, and then we go to the landfill. That's a relatively short downtime that we're anticipating, um, but there is a disposal cost associated with that, um, and then managing um, uh, the dried byproduct. Um, uh, lower, uh, slightly lower in the gasification unit. Um, supplemental fuel oil. We don't have. We don't expect to have 100% um, available methane to run the belt dryer. So we'll be we're carrying some cost of oil for that. Uh, electric electrical uh, demand is about the same for the two units. Maintenance is higher in the gasification compared to the belt dryer, and um, overall operating cost annually is slightly higher in the gasification unit. And then you add in debt service, and um, they're very close, and we're still refining this. This is a, a slide from uh, a draft preliminary engineering report from our engineer. So um, I expect these numbers will be uh, even closer once we work through all the details. But as you can see, um, in either case, we expect that it would be a lower cost compared to s solids disposal that we are currently um, utilizing, bringing everything to the landfill. Um, but right now, it's slightly higher cost for the gasification, but um, has a lot more environmental benefits. Um, so just to expand on some of the benefits um, of both of these projects, this East State Street and the uh, wastewater um, bios held drying project, uh, allows for a more stabilized disposal cost, lower trucking emissions, um, potential beneficial use of the end product as opposed to landfilling at all. Now we have the potential in um, PFAS and PFOA destruction. And for the East State Street project, um, it addresses probably the largest remaining combined um, storm and sewer uh, connection that we have in the city. Um, so we're expecting a significant reduction in overflow events from this project. Um, of course, East State Street well, includes a full road rebuild, so we'll have a much improved um, travel conditions, the Class Two roadway, relatively high traffic. And um, we're also replacing the water and sewer pipes on East State Street, so um, you know, more reliable utilities. And East State Street is actually one of the locations where we've had a high number of water leaks. So um, in addition, we'll be you know, reducing, um, you know, uh, staff demand for repairs. Uh, other projects associated with the uh, water resource recovery facility is uh, the secondary clarifiers. So under the phase one project, we um, we replaced uh, essentially or upgraded essentially all of the equipment except for the secondary clarifiers. Uh, so that will be included in the phase two. It's kind of critical to uh, meeting um, our um, effluent um, water quality requirements. And the other component is uh, odor control. Um, as mentioned earlier, we, the city did receive a notice of alleged violation from the air quality division. And so we are under um, order to take corrective action on the odors from the plant. So this is a, a timeline of what we've done to date. Uh, with regard to odor control. Uh, on November 5th is when we received the notice of alleged violation from the state. Um, we, they had some very tight timelines um, in the initial uh, notice. So we asked them for extension, partly because um, the characteristics of the odors change seasonally. In the summertime, we take in a lot more hauled waste and so we wanted the opportunity to right size equipment, take samples in the summertime when we have, um, you know, the high loadings at the plant, so that we make sure that we get this uh, the equipment size right. Um, following up with that, on January 12th, uh, we had the manufacturer of our existing order control unit uh, do a site visit to assess that equipment. Um, we only have one. One, unit, one piece of equipment on the facility currently that is intended for odor control, and it is really only, um, it's only connected to the Headworks building. That's where the receiving, the trucked waste is received. 
as well as the septage and leachate tanks. Um, so that's kind of the only areas it currently serves. Um, we do expect there's other areas, well we do know, we have verified in fact that there's other areas in the plant uh, that need to be addressed for odor control. Uh, on January 25th, that uh, firm gave us their results and some um, options for a temporary rehabilitation of the odor control unit. Um, shortly after that, on February 3rd, um, the city uh, asked um, energy system groups, who is our engineer for, for the phase one project, uh, for some recommendations or assistance in dealing with um, it's called the blend tank. It's where the, the received waste gets mixed. Our operators had noticed that uh, when they were working up there um, above the blend tank, that there was a very strong um, odor coming from uh, where the mixer connects into the tank. And we learned that the um, that, that required a special uh, lubricant to seal the space between the mixer and the tank. And since then, we have corrected that. So there's one short-term measure that has already been implemented. Um, so fall, and then following the uh, BioREM proposal, we asked our consulting engineer to review the recommendations and provide some feedback. Uh, they were concerned that the proposal um, would result in an undersized unit because we didn't have data from the summer months. Um, again, this was in, in February. Um, so we put that proposal on hold until we could do additional sampling. Uh, on March 7th, we conducted that additional sa uh, sampling. We did it facility-wide. We looked at the dewatering building. Uh, we looked at the septage tank that wasn't uh, sampled um, under the BioREM proposal. And we found that the, um, the septage tank is by far the, uh, the highest levels of hydrogen sulfide, which is the, the primary contributor to odors. Um, which really wasn't identified in that initial round of sampling, so just kind of um, confirm that the seasonal impacts are, are significant. Um, in, in April, April 15th, Brown and Caldwell provided some alternatives for a skid-mounted uh, carbon filter that we could use at the headworks. We looked at um, potentially renting as opposed to um, purchasing um, the, the issue is with the temporary skid is uh, the media life for the, the sizing you can get for those is very short, um, you know, maybe six months at best, and then you have to replace the media. That media cost is about $40,000 um, for each, each round of change out, as well as you know, staff, and, staff and labor time. Um, so we're still evaluating the best alternative we think for um, for the headworks a, uh, a a biofilter unit is the better option as opposed to a skid mounted charcoal filter we think for the dewatering building the best option is going to be the charcoal um, skid and in addition we are um, as a short-term measure we are planning to implement um, chemical treatment into the septage tank, which has those very, very high levels of hydrogen sulfide. Um, so that's essentially our short-term plan is to um, currently do a chemical addition in the septage tank. Um, and we still need, so tonight on the consent agenda, you just passed our amendment with our consulting engineer to do uh, a full design evaluation, right sizing of equipment. Um, currently, we're not comfortable um, without doing you know, a fair amount of uh, additional engineering um, with sizing the equipment. So there's still more work to do, there's more sampling to do, uh, air sampling that is, um, before we uh, really feel like we're comfortable moving forward with um, a purchase or a rental of equipment. And I know that, um, that there's additional questions on this, but I will, you know, open, I will go through the questions that I've received from resi uh, the resident, uh, Ms. Berger. Um, at the end of the presentation, and we can, um, if there's a follow up from that, I can answer them at that time. And this is um, so for East State Street, we are proposing to break the project into two contracts. Uh, this is what we are, the limits of what we're proposing on contract one. Um, 
If you can see my cursor here, this is uh, Main Street, State Street on the left, out to the Rialto Bridge, where the north branch of the river, uh, where it crosses the north branch of the river. And on the right-hand side is East State Street. So the, uh, the goal of the phase one contract is to separate the stormwater out of the sewer system so we get the immediate benefit of the CSO reduction. Um, we, do, we have been informed that we will be receiving a $1.2 million grant through the ARPA. Not officially received the grant agreement yet, but I'm told it's coming. Um, and what we expect that this work will be primarily done trenchless, which means either uh, boring the pipe underground or um, hammering the uh, steel sleeve underground. And the reason for that is that um, in order to get under all the utilities on Main Street, um, we need to be very, very deep. And so it's just not economical to uh, open cut traditional excavate and install pipe um, at, at depths of uh, 12 feet or more. Um, uh, one additional component of this project is that uh, that box on State Street is what's called a vortex separator. Um, so that will take uh, you know the first one inch storm and um, separate out the sediment um, so to improve water quality uh, before it discharges to the river. Uh, the phase two contract is much bigger. It's, it spans um, from the intersection of Main Street all the way up to College Street. Um, it's going to include full replacement of all the water and sewer pipes. Um, it, it will um, allow uh, provide for new sidewalks, a new um, stabilized roadway. And we, had, we also plan to do some work in the parking lot um, that connects from Harry Sheridan. That's where we're proposing um, to put the snow melting system in through district heat. Uh, as well as some additional storm water retention facilities. Um, we are planning to do the design for East State Street, uh, both uh, contract one and contract two in-house. Um, we recently hired a, uh, an, en an engineer um, from the firm that was doing the initial engineering, and that firm has since closed. So um, it seemed like the logical choice for us to move forward in-house. Um, one last point is that there will be some additional uh, public hearings for how we handle the streetscape, competing interests in bike lanes versus trees or additional sidewalks, and we'll present some options when we get into final design and uh, present that to council. Um, so just to touch on the schedule, uh, right now for the water resource recovery facility, we're expecting to start next summer and with completion in the fall of 2024. We hope to allow for pre-purchase of equipment because there are some very long lead times right now. <coughs> uh, for East State Street, we're planning, hoping to start this fall on contract one. Um, that is very dependent on state review, which um, so far we have not heard any comments back. We submitted our preliminary engineering report in March as well as our environmental review documents um, and have not heard comments. So if we're hoping to build that this year, but it's, uh, but it's unknown for sure at this point. And then contract two, we hope to start um, uh, next spring, complete in, uh, in the fall of 2024. So that's a two year project. Some of the challenges we're facing, um, the water resource recovery facility, it's, it's a very complicated, high, a high amount of engineering technical engineering required for that with a lot of different disciplines. Um, and we're also looking at emerging technologies, so we're trying to um, you know, vet, out, uh, vet out the best option of how we move forward. Um, USDA funding requires that they review and approve the engineering reports. Um, as part of that funding condition, American Iron and Steel requirements need to be met for construction. Um, as I mentioned, um, we're seeing really long review times, likely because of the amount of money um, that's being uh, in, you know, put out through the federal government for um, infrastructure. Um, urban soils, um, we, we need to classify uh, contaminants in any, any project basically within city limits is considered urban soil. We need to do testing 
um, and then determine how that soil needs to be managed. It's not something um, that we're very familiar with, but it's something that we need to address on the East State Street project. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing in-house design work on East State Street. And uh, in July 1st, there's new stormwater regulations where anything over half, half an acre of disturbed, which um, uh, East State Street falls under, will require a stormwater permit. It's called an operational permit, um, which sort of stays with the street and in perpetuity. Excuse me. <laughs> um, so just a, a quick note on the funding breakdown. Uh, the solids project um, comes out to about $11.6 million with engineering. Secondary clarifiers is $1.8 million estimated with engineering, and the odor control system is uh, $3 million. So the total estimated project cost for the water resource recovery facility is $16.4 million. And for East State Street, contract one, we're looking at a $1.2 million construction cost. Contract two is uh, estimated at $6 million construction cost. Um, we are anticipating some increase due to uh, inflation. Um, we'll work through that as, uh, as we know more uh, when our construction dates will be. Um, so the total for East State Street is currently estimated at $7.2 million, and the total project, for, uh, project cost for both that we're asking USDA to fund is $23.6 million. And then the funding breakdown for these projects. Um, as noted, USDA grant loan option is, is our primary funding. Um, for the design work, we are getting subsidies through the State of Vermont Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund. Um, generally, for any, um, any work related to clean water, it's a 50% subsidy on design. We have applied for a pollution control grant um, for the uh, solids handling related work at the wa uh, water resource recovery facility. Uh, I mentioned the um, $1.2 million anticipated ARPA grant for East State Street. And we likely will need to do um, short-term financing through our uh, local bond bank um, uh, in order to start the projects. Um, so now I get into questions and I can go through, if we want to start with general questions first from council and then I can follow up with the written questions. You want to do those first? Okay. Sure. All right, the first question I received was um, in regard to the factor dump station. I believe we've addressed that one. We'll move on to the second question. Um, it says, um, in the BioREM report, um, page two noted that the upstream characteristics changed considerably since the original design and installation of the odor control equipment, in part due to the high strength organis organic waste being received in batches. Um, and then it's noted leachate. So um, it is true that the, the BioREM report noted that the characteristics have changed. Uh, it's not related to the leachate though. Um, it's related to the high strength organic waste, which is essentially food waste that's being trucked in. So grease, um, dairy, that sort of waste. Uh, the original odor control unit, the media um, inside it is essentially wood chips. And that's really uh, meant for septage treatment, not for um, uh, organic waste, food waste. So um, really it's not it's, an, it's not a good system currently for dealing with the, the, the hauled high strength organic waste and, and that is part of our study that we will um, replace that unit with a much larger um, unit with a, a different type of media that can handle that, uh, that odor treatment. Um, question number three is uh, the absorption system Biorem is proposing is particularly suited for low concentration applications which we do not have has the system they are proposing for us been successfully used elsewhere? What are the concentrations in the system? And will we potentially need multiple absorption systems? Um, so the first question is, has it been used successfully elsewhere? Is that, the answer is yes. Um, these types of systems are in place. And will we need multiple um, types of uh, treatment? That's, that's also true. We will need um, 
We'll need one unit for the headworks and the septage tank and what we call the mixing tank. We expect one unit to serve those three areas. We'll need a separate unit for the dewatering building. Um, and then we also expect that um, potentially we'll be continuing to do chemical treatment in the septage to reduce those hydrogen sulfide levels, which would in turn expand um, the media life. Um, question number four, are we still receiving leachate from, um, from the CV landfill? Um, so it comes from the Coventry landfill uh, and um, we actually are not currently taking leachate um, for a couple of reasons. Um, it's not related to odors, it's related to um, one, primarily is that we had um, an E. coli violation um, at the plant and uh, we decided as staff that um, until we really can understand why that occurred, so let me back up a little bit. First, as soon as we received the E. coli violation, we stopped uh, receiving, we stopped accepting leachate. Um, and we decided that it was best to wait until, or really spend some time determining how the leachate is impacting the ultraviolet disinfection system before we um, allow it to be returned to the plant. Um, that's the primary reason. The secondary reason is the state of Vermont has just told us that um, we will be under an ammonia l limit under our next discharge permit. Um, and we, are, we have asked our engineer to do a high level study on um, how much of the ammonia uh, entering the plant is um, contributed from leachate. So there's two parts that we're looking at is the, the, the impact on UV and, um, and the impact of ammonia at the plant. Um, so that's in the works, but right now we are not receiving leachate. Uh, question number five. Well, that's, that's exactly what we're evaluating for those two limits, or if there's changes needed. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the, the follow-up question was, um, um, how much leachate are we taking, and how much can our existing and upgraded plant safely and effectively handle? Um, so before we stopped taking leachate, we were taking about 170,000 gallons per week. Um, generally, we hadn't had issues historically until we got this uh, E. coli violation. And so that led us to take a step back and determine you know, exactly how, that, how the leachate is impacting the UV disinfection. Um, so I would say that um, you know, that historically we, we can, um, you know, treat, successfully treat leachate, um, but we had this issue and we're taking the time to evaluate, um, you know, why that happened. Um, question number five is, uh, Brown and Caldwell is developing a plan for short-term remediation efforts for odor control. Um, the city's indicated that the cost will be a factor in whether or not the city utilizes these. Should cost be a factor when negative health and public nuisance impacts are considered? And then uh, a follow up on the vector dump station. Um, so I, th I think the most important part is that we, is that when we spend money on solutions that they are effective. And so right now we're spending, uh, you know, a, f a fair amount of money on making, on really evaluating the odors. So the, the Brown and Caldwell contract on tonight's agenda, I think, was around eighty-three thousand. We've spent about ten thousand or so dollars on um, testing odors so far, with more to come. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think we've gotten to the point where we really know what the best solution is, other than, as I mentioned, um, uh, implementing um, chemical addition to. Uh, treat the hydrogen sulfide in the septage tank. Uh, so I will follow with that. Um, we do plan to do that um, short-term measure um, within the next month. So now that we have approved contract with Brown and Caldwell, um, that's the very first thing we're going to ask them to provide recommendations on is what type of chemical should we use and um, you know at what rate should it be added to that tank. 
said short term. What does that mean? Short term solution. So before, so because the upgrade is gonna is a is two years out before it's completed, we want to do something now to help, you know, help resolve the issue. But it will help as long as you use it, and then you'll decide something else. It isn't that it's only good for so long. Correct. Thank you. It's it's more of a, an immediate um, action rather yeah. than long term equipment. Okay. Um, the next uh, the next question I had from this morning, or it was, um, what is the weekly amount of uh, landfill leachate and local high strength organic waste? Um, from the seven local food processors and haulers that the plant currently receives. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, it's, it was about 170,000 gallons a week of leachate. Um, that is currently zero. And for the high strength organic waste, it's around um, 50 to 60,000 gallons per week. Excuse me, but Kurt, if you, when you uh, get the E. coli uh, situation resolved, will you go be going back to taking the uh, leachate? Um, I, yes, we do plan to, uh, unless there's a red flag through the engineering evaluation. Uh, the next question was, the cost of carbon is skyrocketing. What is the estimated cost of maintenance and replacement? of the carbon medium in the vessels or digesters if that ends up being a component of the final design and when do you anticipate that design being finalized so um, we don't have a perfect number on the media replacement um, other than we had a proposal on a, um, a temporary skid to go to headworks and we did get some high-level cost estimates on um, replacing media in that in that unit. This is, that is the carbon unit. Um, it's a f uh, it was estimated at forty thousand dollars every six months. Um, uh, the design, um, you know that we don't have a, an exact schedule on that. We're still in preliminary engineering right now. Um, that has to be then approved um, from the funding um, the funding agencies. We have to develop a final design contract, which then has to be approved by the funding agency before we can start final design in order to get the subsidies. But I would say, um, you know, early early next year, we hope to be into final design and probably, you know, um, you know, m maybe midwinter hopefully we'll have some solutions but I don't have an exact date for that um, the next question was the BC team noted uh, incomplete air quality testing from BioREM will nationally accepted standards of air quality testing be required by the city are the workers in the plant breathing safe air um, so first there I, I did call to call our engineer on this one uh, there is not a nationally accepted air standard at wastewater plants there's um, best practices there's rules of thumb but there's not a national standard at least that was uh, what our engineer informed me um, as far as our our workers uh, breathing um, safe air um, yes a big part of the phase one contract was to improve the air quality within the buildings um, there's a certain amount of air exchanges you need per hour in order to declassify those uh, areas so that um, all the equipment doesn't have to be explosion proof and we also put in uh, extensive um, air monitoring systems in the plant to, to make sure that the the air is safe there and then the last question um, is ANR and DNC DEC provided grant funding for treatment plant upgrades this is the same agency that uh, monitoring for the city's compliance with corrective actions they are requiring so the plant meets air quality, health, and public nuisance standards. Is this a potential conflict of interest situation? And have has the city received a response from DEC uh, on the progress update sent um, on May 2nd? Um, I don't see, um, so the, the grant we got from ANR for the phase one project was called the Pollution Control Grant. Um, they are part of ANR DEC, but it's a, a whole separate division 
Uh, and so I, you know, I don't see a conflict in them. I mean, they issued the uh, the enforcement action on the city for air quality, so I don't see that um, you know historical grant funding is impacting their actions. Um, as far as a, uh, a, no, a response from the state on my update, um, I have not received one, but I, I don't expect to receive one. It's, um, it's generally not a back and forth. It's the city you know, reporting on what we've done to date, and they log that. Um, us submitting the update you know, was part of that violation response requirement, and we've, uh, we've done that. So I wouldn't expect them to be um, you know, partaking in a, in a back and forth on that. And that is all the questions, unless there are follow-ups. Thank you. <laughs> um, Linda, I know you have some questions. Do you think you can ask them all sort of together? That would be wonderful. Go, go ahead. And, but you, if you would come up and use the um, uh, microphone, that would be great. Thank you. Speak, speak right into oh, the yes, microphone. Brown, Brown and Caldwell, the engineering firm that recommended the gasification um, process. Yes, they recommended that we look into that. And I also should know, I forgot to mention, that um, the gasification unit will have its own odor control component built in with it. Either, either that or the belt dryer, they both would include odor control. Okay. And the only other thing I had was, um, in terms of air quality standard testing, maybe it's not a national standard, but there are accepted, there's a broad uh, list of air quality tests. Will you broaden the list of air quality tests that you're doing in the plant? Because in one of the reports it was, there wasn't the information to be able to respond. Yes, absolutely. So we have done a quite a broad spectrum of, of air testing already, and there's uh, as more to come um, now that we have the approved engineering contract. And I had one question about the snow um, removal. Like, will the water from the snow go directly into the river, or is there a holding system or for dealing with that water? Yep. So that has not been designed yet, but the intent is um, trash screening. Um, so it'll be a, basically this would uh, the snow melting system would consist of a, um, a three-sided uh, concrete structure with uh, heating pipes from the Montpelier's district heat system running through the concrete to heat it up. Um, the city trucks would back up to the snow uh, this melting system and dump into it. The trash would be screened, um, and then the water would be piped into the sewer system <coughs> so that the chlorides, the salts, could be treated at the plant. Thank you. I have so many thoughts, um, and I so appreciate all of this information. This is, I find this stuff fascinating, actually. Um, and <laughs> so, um, I have a lot to say, but I'm going to hold off and see if there's questions from uh, the council. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a few questions. I'm sure you're shocked. <laughs> um, no, it's great to see you again, Kurt. Um, thanks for all that information. Um, just on the kind of looking at the options between the dryer and the gasification, could you just talk a little bit about what the use of the biosolids that would be from the dryer system versus the um, biochar from the gasification? Like, what could those be used for, assuming um, they still would be, I would think, have some chemical contamination of some kinds in them? So just how might they be used <laughs> as an end product? <laughs> So um, currently in Vermont, I believe, uh, Class A material um, can be field applied, can be land applied for um, crops not intended for direct human consumption. So they could go on crops for farm, uh, farm feed. Um, that is likely to change, you know, expecting some further regulation on Class A, um, uh, largely due to the PFAS and PFOA issue. Um, but right now it's allowed. Um, and, and the other thing that we've been talking about is potentially using it for uh, topsoil amendment, um, you know, for potentially state, state projects. But again, there's the PFAS considerations. 
Uh, the biochar um, is the gasification process actually breaks up the carbon chains of the PFAS, and so it's essentially it's um, it, it's destroyed, as as my understanding. And in addition to that, the um, you know even the pharmaceuticals are um, are are basically broken up to a point where it's no longer concerned. So the biochar could um, could conceivably be used for any soil amendment. And including human consumption, um, uh, you know, the topsoil, all the other things that the Class A material could be used for, um, also obviously would be uh, available for the biochar. Um, biochar has expanded options. You can use it for um, for dye and clothing, or um, um, yeah, there's a there's a long list of things. I don't have a, a, everything uh, available right now, but um, certainly get more information on that. Thanks. Um, I just would definitely be concerned if we were putting biosolids, using that for land application, I think. I mean, Maine just banned the application of sludge. I imagine Vermont's going in that direction. I think putting it on, I mean, the farms in Maine in particular have seen so much, you know, these generational farms that are now destroyed because the PFAS levels are so high in the soil and there's like nothing they can do about it. So us contributing to that in any way seems like a bad way to go. I think there are uses. Um, of biosolids that can be put on kind of more already contaminated sites or things. Like I, I think there could very well be ways to use it that would not kind of contribute to other environmental problems. Um, I know you're thinking about that, but just to, <laughs> just to say it. Um, I, for the gasification, I mean, I've, I'm part of a lot of um, conversations about the evolving technologies to destroy PFAS. They're, the only thing I've seen in actually just the last couple of days was something called plasma gasification, which is like the first time that they've actually felt confident that maybe there's this technology that could do it. I mean, a lot of the traditional gasification, which is essentially like incineration, right? Like does not, does not necessarily destroy it. it. You know, you have to be operating, even in the best case scenario, if it does, it has, the system has to be operating perfectly. Otherwise you're getting byproducts. And then if you're, you know, putting them out, they could end up contaminating the community in other ways. So I would, would just be wanting to make sure that that's not going to be, you know, a possibility with anything we would move forward with. Um, I, I mean, one question I had, I'm glad to hear temporarily we've stopped taking the leachate. Um, I know, we, you know, we've been looking for a while at whether we should continue taking the leachate. Are there other, besides? You know, we had talked about the revenue implications of that. Are there other implications on the plant? Like, I know, just, like the balance of different types of waste you need to take and stuff is, is tricky. Like, are there other impacts you've seen that we would need to be aware of if council decided in the future to decide not to take leachate for the longer term? Um, so the the financial impacts from not accepting leachate is one the revenue that we've charged to take it, but. Um, the, the other one is the the increased disposal cost of the solids. So right now all all of our so solids go to the landfill, and we get um, a reduced. We get essentially half what most places pay for solids disposal. Um, so our solids disposal cost would you know essentially double, potentially. Um, and just a couple more. Um, is just on the leachate, is there an update on what's been happening with the pilot project um, for the pretreatment of the leachate in case we do start taking it again? Yep, so um, I did reach out to ANR and um, they suggested um, that Casella come directly and update council. So that is a plan for the next council meeting. Oh, Casella great. is going to join us for that. Great. And I might ask them this too, but just my last question um, Has the city? been looking at all into, and I don't know if this could tie into the project um, that you were walking through, um, but I know that there was specific money for wastewater treatment facilities to address um, contamination from chemicals like PFAS in the infrastructure bill. So the state got money to install like filtration systems, which um, I would think Montpelier should be top of the list for Vermont's pot of money if we're going to be this, the site of leachate um, off-taking. Uh, so is that something that could be, is that exploration happening? Um, would that fit into what's already being done? Is that 
part of this project and I missed it or just any thoughts on how that might be a possibility? Yeah, um, certainly a possibility. We, it, it's not currently part of the project. It, it could be added in. Um, I did um, hear from Casella this week and they've asked the city to co-sponsor a grant application um, for them to um, build their pretreatment system on leachate. Um, I haven't seen that grant opportunity come out specific to um, uh, wastewater treatment plants, but if you know if you see that, uh, please pass it along. <laughs> I have not yet. Yeah, I, I think it was part of that infrastructure bill that there's not even final guidance on, so I'm guessing it will come out in the next year or so, but if we're doing this planning and engineering, it might be worth some conversations, but maybe we can ask ANR about that next time they're in. Thanks, okay. Kurt. Yep. Questions for Jack, go ahead. I don't have a question. I just want to express my appreciation for the comprehensive and uh, very detailed presentation. Thank you. Uh, so I have a, a do you have a comment? Yeah, I'm yeah. David second that. I'm glad there are people like you on the show. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Uh, so I have a, a few questions. Um, so in terms of the hot water belt dryer um, versus the drum dryer and gasifier alternative, so these, I just want to make sure I'm understanding where we're at with that. So these are both um, methods that we are considering that, like we wouldn't do both of these things. We would do one or the other, right? Correct. And, and you're at this point, um, Am I correct in assuming that you're, you're, you're still investigating both of them and you don't necessarily have a recommendation for us as to which like one is better at this point? Or are you recommending the dryer and, or, yeah, are you recommending one at this point? Um, no. Okay. And, okay. Uh, so also in terms of the funding, um, thinking about the most recent bond that we passed uh, with all of the um, other potential funding sources that we have available to us you know th that you mentioned are those going to like um, do you, I guess basically my question is do you anticipate anticipate using the entirety of the bond that we most recently passed um, to do this or and, and using the funding in addition to that, or does the funding that you talked about potentially eat down the costs below the level of the bond? Yeah, I mean, it's the construction climate is more unpredictable than we've ever seen. Okay. So it's difficult to say where we're going to land financially. I think um, if our estimates come in uh, where they're at right now and, and when we actually go to construction, I think we would have um, additional bond capacity unused. Um, but I think it's too early to say that for sure at this point. Okay. And do you, so you, um, you have some engineers looking into both of these options for us right now. What is roughly the timeline for coming back to us with a recommendation? Uh, so that would be prior to final design once we okay. um, wrap up all the components of the preliminary engineering. Which uh, you mentioned. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, probably. Mm, you know, late fall, maybe. Yeah. Somewhere in that, in okay. That range. Um, okay. I just also want to add that. Well, okay. Uh, have have you all been in touch with other gasification plants around the country and how that has worked for them? Yeah. So that's one of you know one of our concerns. This is a relatively new technology. Um, so there's there are three. To follow up on what Laura mentioned, there's, I didn't know about the plasma one, but there are th <laughs> three that I was aware of. Um, there's pyrolysis, which is the first one we looked at, had a very high construction cost. Um, so that is um, basically burning the material with an absence of air. Um, and there's incineration, which is high air, um, and burning material with a lot of oxygen. And then there is uh, gasification, which is low oxygen burning of materials so they're all you know basically incineration but with different mixtures of oxygen going into the system um, 
So we, we, there aren't any active um, that we're aware of. We went to, um, uh, Chris and I, the chief operator, went to uh, Pennsylvania to meet with another community that is looking at the same process. Um, we've also um, heard that there's going to be one uh, being built in, um, in Washington State, which we, we, if we have time, we would like to go look at that one. <laughs> that one will be constructed um, you know, before we would get to construction. I think they're about to start. Um, so yeah, it's all really, really new. That's why we need more time to really evaluate that alternative and make sure it's right for us. Um, great. Um, I just want you to know that I'm very interested in the pyrolysis option. I mean, I think for just from everything I've heard, like the the benefits of biochar, um, it's, it seems really hopeful and really promising. And so I, I want to recognize that it has its own, for me, it has its own gravity um, in terms of like, I'm really hopeful that it works, but I also know that I need to um, stay open to the option that it, it might not be the right um, choice for us. Um, so I just want to say that out loud um, so that uh, you all can help hold me accountable to that. Uh, but nonetheless, I am really hopeful uh, about uh, pyrolysis, about biochar, um, and that option. But I trust your analysis and <laughs> see what you all come up with. Um, anything else um, we have that folks have comments they want to make? Okay, yep, go ahead. Steve Whitaker, that's a lot of topics uh, into one. With regard to the uh, phase two, it's important to keep in mind that phase one was a $16 million that didn't anticipate a phase two. Now this project has in effect doubled to $32 million. And I'm not saying it's not good work or good design or good analysis, but it's, it's, in proportion to where we're neglecting so much other infrastructure in the cities, the conditions of our roads and sidewalks and storm drains, you know, a little kid, a person who just got evicted out of the transit center, you know, fell in the gap in, in, on the bridge, on your bike path bridge, your multi-million dollar bike path bridge fell and ruined her walker because we're not taking care of maintenance. It was two years ago that our snow plow damaged the aluminum gap fillers. And I was told we last year we were getting steel inserts to fix that. But we, we've lost sight of the basics that make people safe and comfortable in Montpelier. And we're investing way too much money in these, you know, engineering uh, space moonshots. Uh, I note that the bond warning and all the press around the bond warning had already decided a, a, a conveyor dryer. Uh, so now we're, I'm told we're not necessarily doing the conveyor dryer, we're doing some other technology that may preclude use of the, the bonded funds without another vote. But uh, I also want to question the idea that of using in-house design. Not that our guys aren't capable of it, but it's been in effect, it might be more cost effective to devote our in-house guys to fixing and designing solutions to all these other failed infrastructure projects that have built up over the decades and, and hire out an engineering firm to design our, our state, East State Street project. Uh, I understand that it's a nice way to get the state to pay for half of our staff uh, under that match, but there seems to be enough money around today to uh, focus on getting caught up on some of this stuff. Uh, you haven't done this for anybody else. This, this was an hour long presentation that I have to comment a bunch of topics on. So the uh, pyrolysis, if that's what you're calling, incineration is a very imperfect science and the combustion, I, I want to commend Lauren for bringing that up, that we could potentially be toying with the idea of spewing PFAS across our, uh, in, into our school children's lungs and, and across our uh, 
gardens, community gardens. Um, Steven, you're at three minutes, so wrap up your comments, please. I am the only person you've done that to. These are these are comments on a on a different topic, and you're imposing the two minutes unfairly on me. So. And so you're done I now. I learned to expect that from you. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. All right. And so, does anyone else have comments? And comments online. Anyone online have comments? Okay. I'm not seeing any. Um, I do want to address one comment uh, that Stephen made that it, the first bond did not anticipate phase two, but that's not accurate. I believe it did. Um, and uh, yeah, any th so at this point, um, there's no more comments about the bond, if I'm not cr mistaken. Um, so I'm gonna close the public hearing on that and I think, uh, so there's nothing that you need us to, to, to vote on at this point, right? Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Kurt. Yeah, thank um, you. This is very helpful. Yes, go ahead. I'd just like to thank Linda Berger for her really thoughtful yes. questions, too. Uh, I know, you know she lives really near the plant and is very concerned with the odors, and I appreciate you staying on top of it. We're trying to keep you informed, and, and I know you like to have these conversations with the council, and that's great, but I hope you also know you can ask Kurt or I or anybody, any questions at any time, we'll, I'm, I'm happy to get back to you. So we do appreciate your involvement. I agree, thank you, Linda. Okay, so now we are up to the Elks Club funding uh, item. So um, first of all, uh, before we jump into this too much, I'd like to introduce Josh Jerome to everybody. Josh is our <coughs> new community and economic oh. development specialist, the artist formerly known as Kevin Casey. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Josh, uh, would, would you want to give us a quick little background? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I've lived in Montpelier for the, almost the last 20 years. Um, and my partner and I have three teenage girls at, uh, in the school system um, and for, have worked in central Vermont in community and economic development uh, for over the last decade. So um, as, a, as a lender with Community Capital Vermont, Barry Partnership as their executive director, um, and uh, most recently as uh, Randolph's director of economic development. So happy to, to be back in my hometown um, doing what I love to do um, and working for the city of Montpelier and, and, and you guys. Great. A lot shorter commute after the meetings. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and he has really hit the ground running with us on a, on a bunch of things. Um, for this particular issue, I don't think, you know, we haven't planned a presentation. When we last talked to you about the unfolding process with the Elks Club project, it, we said we would come back to you with a draft RFP and some suggestions for funding. Uh, Josh really jumped on it, took the lead on the drafting, which is, is why he's here. Um, for the funding, I think you can see what we recommended here. I mean, obviously, we don't have a lot of money in our budget other than um, reallocating, and I, I think using the 50000 that we had in for economic development is not a bad idea, just as long as we're clear that we're putting off the economic development strategic plan that we plan to do that. So, so we're doing that eyes wide open. And then the revol using the revolving fund and or the trust fund um, as a loan, so that as we sold future lots or earn income from the property, we would repay it. So essentially fronting the money. Obviously, we may need more next year, but we'd be able to budget for it more properly as we, d we do the budget. But that that was really our thought, um, but we wanted to be sure you had a chance to weigh in or give us any suggestion. Is it still all in draft form? And uh, as the key author, we want to make sure Josh heard him, heard it firsthand and a, and a chance to introduce himself. Okay. Um, thoughts or questions from council for Josh? Do you have something? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, oh, yes, Jack, go ahead. I hope we may approve the uh, uh, draft RFP so we can get this thing moving. Second. Okay, great. Further discussion? Did, was that intended to include the funding, recommended funding? Um, any other comments? Yes, Carrie. 
Yeah, um, thank you for this. Um, it's really comprehensive. Um, but I'm wondering about the timeline of all of this work, and I'm, I'm not sure if I missed it in here because I didn't. May not, uh, I yeah, there, there should be a timeline in yeah. the, in the RFP. I think um, I think it's dated June, um, and yeah. with proposals due back July, review done in August, and October 1st as this mm -hmm. start. I mean, for um, from October 1st on. For There's the an 18th month window for, okay. for planning activities. Okay, great. So the deliverables are all expected at the end of that 18 months? Yes. Um, do you expect that they may come in along the way, or do you expect that that will all happen at the end of 18 months? Th there might be some pieces of it that are known mm -hmm. before the end of the 18 months, but a full complete sort okay. of presentation would be due at the end of the 18 okay. months. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Any other thoughts or comments? Uh, Lauren. Um, nice to meet you. Welcome. Um, I guess my only question was we had the conversation a couple weeks ago with the hub project and like how might that align or not with this? Um, I mean, the timeline certainly is um, not what they're hoping to see in terms of being able to move forward, um, which I think this is what it needs to be, to be doing the due diligence and planning and community engagement that we want. Um, but just curious how worth the city staff is thinking about how we're kind of intersecting with that proposal. So I'll take this one. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> remain in you know, con communication with them. They understand where we're going. They, un you know, they obviously have what they'd like to see. Um, I, I don't think there's a hard answer for how we're going to handle that. Um, once we identify the, the firm or entity that's going to do this work, we can talk to them about, uh, in my head only, you know, we have, we've talked about recreation, open space, and housing. And you know, maybe as those pods are being sorted out, if, if the recreation space was determined first, and then we could evaluate how that was going to look, and, and that was ready to move ahead of some of the others, then we could do that. If it's not, um, you know, we're kind of betwixt and between with them. I don't think you know we're not building our plan around them. They've got an idea, and at some point we'll ask for submittals of ideas, and we'll evaluate their idea along with everyone else's, but we've made no, no commitments to them as far as partnering. But we've also, we've also, you know, it's, I, I want to be clear once again, is that they had, they had pursued this privately and we went to them and said, hey, we ought to partner with your project to do a rec project. And then it turned around and, and came to be, you know, the city owning the property and, and doing these things. So, you know, they, they, did a lot of legwork to get this going, and so we're trying to keep them in the loop, but also in being honest about where we're at. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Just um, kind of following up on that a little bit. Um, the uh, I, I want to make sure that it's really clear to all of us that um, we're not determining ahead of time what kind of uses will be considered or will not be considered. And, and I think that's pretty clear in the RFP, but I, I, it's not necessarily always so clear as people are sort of casually talking about it. And so um, I just want to get that out there, say that really clearly, that maybe there will be recreation um, as a proposed use. Maybe there will not be. Maybe there will be housing. Maybe there will not be. And that that's, this process is to answer those questions, yeah. right? That is correct. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Super. Uh, all right. Any further thoughts from anybody? Yes. Go ahead. Peter Ka Peter Kalman, uh, Montpelier. I I just have a question because I didn't I didn't see the RFP. Bill, what did you mean by the, which treating which? Where are you borrowing the money for, in a revolving fund manner? What 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 fund? We have a economic community development revolving fund. 
um, and we think there's enough money in there, and we would loan ourselves the money and essentially repay it. Um, if there, were, if it were short, we would obviously th going through the proper process consider requesting from the housing trust fund, since part of this is potentially to develop housing with repayment, of course. But that is that has to be approved through all. That's not part of this motion. <coughs> that's a future. Okay. Motion. All right. So you might. <laughs> want to go to the housing and, trust and we'd have to go through the committee and we'd have to come to the city council and all that we're not we can't just read it okay so uh, my other question is if you if we're delaying the uh, economic uh, strategic development plan which i th which i think is a, a good idea but i don't think it's a good idea to continue to refer back to the 2016 plan which I really think is not applicable to today's Montpelier. And I, I, I hope we'll stop referencing that plan and just say th there will be a new plan and the new plan will reflect the realities of today. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, anyone else? The, uh, the, uh, I'll note that the EDSP was not defined in the, uh, Steve Whitaker, was not defined in the uh, city manager's cover sheet for this. So I'm now trying to understand what, uh, how that fit together. The uh, $60,000 $60, is gonna complete this, this uh, feasibility analysis. I mean, are, are we getting, are we gonna end up getting out of this a uh, full analysis of whether that tr railroad track is going to block the traffic volume and make that intersection safe up to state highway standards. Is that included in here? Because I haven't had time to process this one copy and I should have loaned it to him, you know. Um, I think we're unsure of at this time. That's why I think Bill mentioned that we would might have to seek some additional resources to do that. So it's the 50,000 gives us a starting point. Um, of course, we haven't been able to receive any proposals or cost estimates or anything like that. So, um, so, so yeah, to answer your question, I mean, we're looking at the full feasibility of the process project that includes any potential obstacles. Uh, so to the extent that that crossing is, is an obstacle and we're not sure it is um, but if it is then obviously that's something that will have to be identified and then the part of a future project cost to address um, along with you know water and sewer line everything else that needs to, to go into it so and to be clear um, and, and by the way the EDSB is mentioned but that's beside the point um, the uh, we're talking about 50,000 from that and another hundred thousand from the housing uh, revolving loan fund so we're talking about 150,000, not just 50. That, that, and, and you know, we're not sure that will be enough, but it should be enough through this fiscal year. I mean, it's a pretty extensive project with a lot of design and engineering and analysis that needs to be done, but we won't know for sure until we hear back. I guess my question relates to whether or not we're assuming that this, pro this parcel has to accommodate the rec needs of the city versus if, if it's not, feasible we'll look at others the capital complex commission for instance can look at liquor control moving so their warehouse somewhere else and that's an ideal spot for a rec center you know so i'm just i'm, I'm wanting to not carve us so deep in down into this right so part of this is that we have to drive to get recreation I understood part of this is to see if it's a viable project here if there's not we can sell the land Okay, anyone else in person? Okay, and I am not seeing any hands online, but okay, go ahead, Donna. I, I'm, I was ready to make a motion. Oh, I think we have a we motion, have a motion. Oh, okay. and right. it's been seconded. Uh, it's okay. Um, so any further discussion on this? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, and so we are up to, oh, you know what? Yes, I was gonna say, it is 8.28, and we normally take a break at 8.30, so I think now is the appropriate time to do that. Uh, oh, 8.29, all right, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break. We will be back at 8.39.
All right, well, we should get started here again. It is 8.39. All right, so we are jumping back in and uh, jumping back in with an update on the um, energy, oh, uh, sorry, the um, uh, energy information ordinance. And uh, so this was just to update the council on the work that's been done since uh, the ordinance was approved uh, last year or so. Um, there's a, a number of things that have been done. I guess I'll, I'll just talk through this a little bit. Um, so mostly looking under the background information on the cover sheet. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, there was uh, education that was done for real estate agents um, through professional development. And I uh, was told by Ken Jones that he wanted me to relate to you that he is going to continue to do uh, professional development for uh, real estate agents uh, uh, moving forward to help educate them about the tool. Um, and so the, there's a flyer that's going to be going out in water bills in July. Um, as to specifically how to comply, like what steps people would need to follow. Um, we developed a, an MOU with the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships to clarify um, questions about data ownership that came out uh, up in our previous discussion. Uh, there's a, a certification sheet for buyers and sellers to sign off on to certify that the um, profile has been provided to the buyer. Uh, and then the, the remainder of this is really about um, in, the enforcement. So a, a sort of a standardized non-compliance letter was developed that would go out to folks who uh, are uh, who don't have it posted uh, properly or provided properly. Uh, and there's a time for folks to rectify that before a ticket is is issued. And then um, so the enforcement. Uh, plan is uh, was was specified as well. So, uh, happy to take any questions about that. Yes, I, I'm just facing. What was the? It was voluntary for a period, right? Yep. Is what is that period? Yep. So, thank you. <laughs> and that's actually why we're talking about this now, okay. uh, because it's voluntary through um, the end of June. So, starting to be enforced to July 1st. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. So, we wanted to make sure that we had this update before then. You have a few weeks to be in compliance, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> so <in the> <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I know this is one of your vanity projects, but the public records law does not allow you to just say, you're our contractor, you could keep our data. That you're requiring by ordinance people to submit data to prove compliance with an ordinance uh, you can't offshore the data like that. So it, it, it's real folly to think that you can just, you know, tell the company that they own our data uh, it, with, because you crafted an MOU. So uh, you, need, you needed to hear that and act accordingly. Okay, thank you. Um, just so the council is aware, we did have the MOU reviewed by the city's lawyer. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Yes. Uh, I, 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 want, I have one question and then maybe a comment. How many people voluntarily did this? That's a great question. Um, we don't know of anybody who did voluntarily do it. We know that people, uh, and, and also posted it to their um, listing but well, we know that it can be done. Um, okay, so the only comment I would make at this time is that it's a good thing that there aren't very many houses for sale right now so that you can get this working. So my follow-up is, what about new construction? Uh, how, how, how is that covered by the ordinance? So, so somebody builds a new house or condominium or whatever, there's, there's no history. How, how would this work? So are you, you're saying that somebody- And they sell, they, they, sorry, it's built yeah. and now it's sold by the builder. Got you. 
Good question. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, for the ordinance or for the the profile to work, you you can enter bill data, but you don't have to. It's designed to work ba work based on the assets of the house. I, that's kind of a fancy way of saying just basically based on the features of the house or the physical attributes of, of the house. That should be sufficient to get a profile, um, and that the bill information is supplemental to that. Um, I hope that answers your question. But to be fair, there are, but yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I will leave it there. Um, to be fair, um, I will be interested in reevaluating this in like another year's time or so to see like how, how has it gone? What's, um, is it doing what we think it's intended to do? Um, so let's, let's keep, uh, keep watching it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? And I'll, let me just check online here. Not seeing anybody. Okay. Uh, and there's no motion, I believe, that is necessary for this. Um, all right, so on to the Housing Task Force report. Um, and I am welcoming up Holly Nichol. Welcome. Thank you. So Cameron, am, yes. am I able to um, show the PowerPoint that I sent? I didn't get your PowerPoint. Did, did they come? Oh, Mary said, oh, okay, did, did you all get it? Is it in the packet? Yes. Okay, well then I will okay. pull it up from the packet. Great. No worries. I just didn't get Thank the actual you. PowerPoint. Sorry about that. <laughs> Take me just a second to maneuver. Share your item. Sorry about that. I should have sent you a copy. It's okay. <laughs> Is this what you want to no. show? No. It looks like this. That's it. Okay. So if you share it, I'm you can it. click through it this way. So. Um, I'll come right back up and with, share this with the arrow, not the down arrow. Yes. So hold okay. Just as <clears throat> there we go, and I will share the screen so folks at home can see it, and we're good to go. So there you go, and those arrows will move okay. forward. Well, thank you um, for giving us the. Time. I'm here to um, give you some updates on some things that the task force recommended to you a year ago and also to update some of the housing um, data for the city. Oops, okay, it's not moving. Um, so population and household composition, this is largely um, census data from the American Community Survey, but um, as has been the case for a while, the median household income in Montpelier is higher than the statewide median. Um, we were at $70,000 versus roughly 62000 statewide. Um, as of um, 2020, we had 8,074 people and almost 3,900 households. Um, our households are small, uh, just 1.9 uh, persons per household, and that's actually they, that's actually um, gone down. Um, so our households are getting smaller, and 24% um, of the population is over 65, and that has gone up slightly um, in the past year. 20% of the population is under 18, and the median age is 45. 55% um, of our population is female, 94% Caucasian, and approximately half of our workforce does not live in Montpelier. Uh, so then we looked at rental housing. 
and 44% uh, of our housing stock is rental, and about 14% of Montpelier households pay more than half of their income for housing, and that's slightly less, very slightly less, than the statewide statistic. Um, and the census data says that the median gross rent for Montpelier is $1,169, um, which is higher than the statewide median of $985. Um, and in 19, uh, sorry, 2018, um, the census said our median rent was $992. But when the census looks at rent, they ask people what they're paying, and that's not what you would have to pay if you went out to rent an apartment in Montpelier. So I went on um, Craigslist and apartments.com. There were very few listings, especially for apartments, um, and the median rent was $1,625, and there only were five apartments listed. There were a couple single rooms, there was a tiny house, um, and a very small one-bedroom apartment that still was, was renting for quite a bit. Um, Montpelier Housing Authority reports that their voucher holders are having difficulty finding apartments. Um, those are in privately owned buildings um, because most of the private landlords have no vacancies and all of the Montpelier Housing Authority owned and managed apartments are full except for ones that are in the process of being turned over and ready for someone else. Oops. We didn't do anything. It will hopefully rejoin us. Okay. Um, we know that our rental vacancy rate is <laughs> extremely low. Um, one of the statistics I saw online was that it's 1.1 percent, but I honestly don't know how reliable that that website is and, and that statistic, <laughs> but um, it's we definitely have virtually no vacancies. And um, according to the Housing Authority, a lot of our landlords are older and are thinking about selling. Homeownership, um, I looked at the property uh, transfers between June of 2021 and February 2022, and the median sales price was exactly $300,000. Um, that includes condos, and they tend to be at the lower end of the market. Most of those were in the, in the 200s, um, mostly low 200s. The average price was 326 797 but um, using the median is, is, is more accurate because um, that, that gives you a better sense. It doesn't get distorted by either a very low figure or a very high figure, um, as you know. And 20% of the sales were condos, the rest were single family homes. I then went to the MLS listings, and in Mid Bay there were 18 listings. Most of those um, were under contract or with a sale pending. And the median price of the MLS listings for Montpelier was $384,000. Um, According to realtors, the length of time that homes stay on the market has decreased by about two-thirds just since 2020. And um, as you probably know, we're now seeing a few homes uh, selling for over a million dollars in Montpelier, which just <laughs> would have been inconceivable a few years ago. I just can't believe it. Um, during the past 10 years, our home values have appreciated nearly 44%. And unfortunately, a household earning 120% of median, which is considered um, like moderate income, um, can afford a mortgage of approximately $225,000. And that calculation was made before interest rates started going up and before fuel costs started going up so much. So if our median list price is 384 and um, a household of modest means, not even low income, um, can only afford a mortgage of 225, obviously there's a, there's a big gap. Um, and I think, um, a concern about who's going to be able to afford to live in this city. Um, the task force hasn't 
focused a lot on people without homes, um, but I did go and look at the uh, point in time survey for 2021. That This is Washington County data. My pillar isn't big enough to, to be broken out separately, but um, when that survey was done, which I believe was January 2021, um, there were 327 people without permanent homes in Washington County. Washington County was the third highest in the state. The good news was that nobody was unsheltered um, who, who they counted. And I, I think the 2022 survey information should be coming out soon, but this is, this is the most recent that we have. Um, of those 327 people, there were 64 children, and most of the people, 310 of the people, were in emergency shelter situations. 17 were in transitional housing. A third of the people were experiencing homelessness for the first time, which sadly means that two-thirds of those people, this wasn't their first go-round with, with being unhoused. And 57 households were characterized as chronically homeless, all, all single people, no, no households with children. I, I'm not sure how they define chronically homeless, but I would expect it's repeated um, experiences of, of being without a home. And more men are homeless than women in Washington County. And then we looked just briefly at short-term rentals, and um, I looked at the Airbnb listings. They said there were 227 listings in Montpelier, but in reality, 39 were actually in Montpelier. The rest were in Middlesex or East Montpelier or surrounding communities. Most of those listings were apartments or single family homes. There were only four that were rooms in a, in a larger house. So um, it's not a huge number, but given our housing situation, that's you know, 30, 35 dwellings that uh, you know, somebody could live in uh, year round that are being used for short term rentals. And the growth in the housing stock, as you know, has been extremely slow. Um, it's really minuscule. And the, the statewide growth, as you can see, 0.6% um, is, is pretty slow, too. Um, but we're, we're even below that. So um, here's, here's a couple observations from all that. Obviously, Montpelier is becoming less affordable for household of modest means. Um, the inventory of for sale homes is very low, and most homes are under contract very quickly. We know from talking to realtors that there are bidding wars, um, and that when there's a bidding war, there's often a sale above the asking price. Um, because prices are so high, condos are becoming a more desirable option. That market, I guess, was, was kind of stagnant for a number of years, um, but with fewer fit single family homes for sale, um, condos are seen as a decent alternative. And so condo prices are rising too. Um, some of this is anecdotal, but um, an out of state investors have begun to solicit sales of Montpelier properties sight unseen. I don't know if anyone else has had the experience that I had a couple months ago getting a letter in the mail from an investor from Texas saying, <laughs> do you want to sell? Um, and uh, climate refugees have begun to see Montpelier in Vermont as a desirable place in which to move. And again, I had somebody, I was in my front yard, I had somebody stop me and asked me questions about Montpelier, and when I asked him where he would be moving from, he said uh, southern Colorado because of the drought and the fires. He was looking for a place with water. So it, it's, it's really not hypothetical. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing that, um, at least on a, on a certain level. Um, we still have many larger homes occupied by one or two people. Uh, friends who I talk to in my age group, many of them talk about downsizing, but there's really no place to go, so they stay put, or we stay put. Um, and high construction costs are leading to high sales prices and rent levels. That's statewide, that's nationwide. And um, 
high fuel costs are leading to significant increases in the cost of housing. Joe Triano from the Housing Authority mentioned that as a very big deal to her landlords and, and um, voucher holders. And, and of course, it's having an impact. Good news is it seems that our development pipeline has expanded and there are a few larger developments proposed. And um, finally, the number of unhoused people in Washington County remains high. So what are the barriers to new development in Montpelier? Here are just some, some thoughts. Um, we don't have a lot of large developable parcels of land. We have a, we have a few, um, but, but not many. Um, unlike Chittenden County, we don't have a lot of private developers looking to develop in Montpelier. There's uh, a couple of key developable parcels who are owned by just two people who so far haven't developed them. There's a history of neighborhood opposition when something is proposed. And then market conditions, I think that's a big thing. You all saw that with the um, transit center project. Construction costs are the same as Chittenden County, um, but the market rent or the sales price is lower, and so it's a disincentive for Chittenden County developers to work in Montpelier because um, if they work in Chittenden County and, and they can either sell or rent for more money. And a lot of the development in Montpelier over the past few years has been done by downstreet housing and community development, but um, they have limited capacity and they are feeling pressured to serve other communities as well. Um, they do say they love working in Montpelier. The city's a great partner, but um, they, ca they can't just work in Montpelier, so. So a year ago, we made a number of recommendations to you, and um, here, here's a few updates. The first one was fund the Housing Trust Fund at a level of 150,000 annually. I think um, it's, in a, um, it's, it's being funded around 110,000. That's great. You know, we'd, we'd like to see it at 150, but um, it's, it's definitely, uh, I think, a strong show of support from the council and um, the, the trust fund is used to, to help get some of those developments off the ground. Um, we also recommended supporting a shared appreciation home ownership pilot for first time home buyers. Downstreet did submit an application to the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Committee. That application was tabled. Um, I'm hoping it will come back, but given the discrepancy between prices and what people can afford even with a subsidy from the trust fund um, and the and the lack of inventory I don't, I don't know um, <laughs> it, it it's still going to be a heavy lift but um, I, I think it is a way to get to, to provide opportunity for some um, home buyers of modest means who don't have either a lot of savings or family support or or something like that um, another recommendation was working with the state of Vermont regarding the possibility of making some of the parking lots available, um, maybe with parking on the ground floor and um, housing above. Mary Hooper did work on that. Um, she, she talked to the powers that be at the state and they said they are interested in exploring that with the city. Um, what they told her was right now they're trying to figure out what's happening with the state workforce in terms of how, how many people are gonna um, be remote and how many days a week and how much parking they will need and how much office space they will need. But um, they also mentioned to her that maybe some of those uh, state office buildings in the Capitol complex might be available um, for an alternative use such as housing as well. Acquire land and make it available for housing development. Yay. Um, you guys are, um, that's, that may happen uh, through the Elks Club. Uh, work with Vermont College of Fine Arts to determine if there are possibilities for housing in some of their underutilized buildings. Kevin Casey did have a conversation with those folks. Again, they are trying to figure out their future. They're doing strategic planning, but um, didn't, didn't slam the door on that and then um, support programs to reduce homelessness. 
Um, and we also have some additional recommendations. Um, one is create a city appointed housing committee. Talked to you about that a couple of weeks ago and that's in process. Um, hopefully that will be well publicized and, and, um, and people who are interested um, will be able to apply. Develop housing on the outcrowd property. Uh, continue the accessory dwelling unit program. As, as you may know, there um, was a federal grant for that program through the, the Department of Housing and, and um, Community Development. That's just about wrapped up, but that is um, an allowable use for Montpelier's Housing Trust Fund, and the beauty of using city money through the Housing Trust Fund is there's a lot less red tape, and um, it, it would make it a lot easier for, for people to add accessory dwelling units, and, and that is a way of adding to the housing stock. It's, it's incremental, but every little bit helps. Um, Undertake an inventory of potentially developable properties that could accommodate 10 or more units for future land banking opportunities. Um, to my knowledge, that that's a possibility, um, that, um, but nothing is, is in the works on that. Um, I think we recommended last time that if a property goes up for tax sale, give first option to purchase to a nonprofit. Um, some of you pointed out there are virtually no tax sales, but um, should that happen, it, 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 it could be an opportunity to, um, to get, get some housing or, or make sure that um, housing is a, a housing unit is, is, is available to uh, a family who needs it. Um, this one, as part of the reappraisal, undertake an inventory of short-term rentals in order to ascertain the extent to which Montpelier may be losing permanent housing. I know the reappraisal has started, but I really think, um, you know, if the appraisers could just be asked to make a note of um, what what the use of the property is, if that isn't happening already. Um, it, it would give us the information that we need to know. Do we have a problem or is it really so minuscule? Let's, let's worry about other things. Um, provide more support for housing initiatives through the Planning and Development Department, whether through VISTAs, consultants, or staff. I think that the housing situation in Montpelier is so serious and that department is not very large, that um, if there's any way that they can get more person power <laughs> to work on these issues, I think a lot more could be done, but um, there's, on there's only so much um, the, the existing staff can do. Uh, support the Christchurch project so that it becomes viable. I do know that that project uh, recently received, a, a, last week received a planning grant from Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and they're going to look at um, a bunch of issues around it. I think because even with all the federal and state money, the funding environment is so incredibly competitive that whatever the city can do um, to support that project um, just will help give it give it a leg up and, and help it compete because it is a difficult site um, because it's downtown it involves demolition and and uh, it's always easier to build out in a field but um, it it could be an important resource um, educate the public regarding housing issues and encourage engagement and dialogue regarding new developments maybe this is something that the new housing committee will do but um, it's it, it seems like whenever or almost whenever something is proposed, there's a lot of opposition and people need to be heard and need to um, be listened to and have input. Um, but we also, I think, need to break the, the log jam where historically not a whole lot has, has been built new in part because of neighborhood opposition and developers just going away discouraged. And then um, 
finally support a bridge solution to house people who are unhoused. So um, that's, those are our recommendations. That's what we know about the state of housing in Montpelier right now, and I'd be happy to take questions if anyone has any. Thank you so much, Polly. Um, and thanks for that update on the recommendations. That was uh, helpful because it's uh, you know, it's nice to know that there are things that we can that we can do. I I do have a question for you. Um, one of the things that has come up from the planning commission is a discussion around density, uh, and I am wondering about if the group has thoughts on lifting density requirements or um, maximums? We didn't really talk about it except um, to get a report at our last meeting from Mike Miller and he explained his, his thinking that um, other things needed to happen first but we didn't really take a position on it. Okay. Because if that comes back up to the council, that would be helpful if you all do have an opinion about it. Um, okay. So, other thoughts, Lauren? Go ahead. First of all, thank you so much. The amount of research you've and the committee have been doing is incredible and such a resource. And so, just thanks for so much thank work you. and thought that's gone into that. Um, gives us some really good next steps, I think. Um, my only question was knowing that the state just put huge amounts of money and you know some of the issues you're raising you know for example there's the program that's going to help with covering some construction costs to get at that middle income um, family and so on like what are there good resources available to you all how well connected are you to all you know we've got this like slug of money yeah. that has to be spent really quickly and you know are there ways that we're just making sure that Montpelier can take as full advantage of the federal funds and then the state allocating, you know, a huge amount to VHCB and, and other um, partners. And so just curious I mean, what your thoughts are on that. I, I think we need a project, um, you know, and, and maybe the next one in line is Christchurch. I don't know. Um, but you have to have a project to go after the, the funding. And so um, I do think from funders' perspectives, Montpelier is considered a good partner, um, you know, just like Down, Down Street said, because the city's been supportive and with the housing trust fund, um, taxpayer money goes in and um, it, projects here like the French blocks and Taylor Street and whatever have, have been remarkably successful. I mean, it's it really, um, I, I can't remember one that's that's been turned down. But we need a project. So. Other thoughts? Connor, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. It's, uh, as Lauren said, really well researched, but I think very accessible to and useful information. Um, you. When you're talking uh, Elks Club development, is there any specific type of housing you're proposing, like affordable housing or mixed, or we need everything? That's you know, we haven't had a conversation about that in any detail as a task force. I mean, if you're asking me personally, I think we need a mixture. I think we need housing for families. We need housing for seniors and not just low-income seniors. So um, people who have big older homes um, have a place to move to. Um, obviously, we have a, a situation with people who don't have houses at all so I, I think I think we need it all <laughs> so yeah uh, yes go ahead. I just said so first of all thank you it was excellent I just want to add on to this I, uh, last Thursday and Friday I was at a meeting of Vermont town and city managers and we heard a presentation from Seth Leonard the from Vermont housing finance and I'm telling you you could take those slides and just put Vermont everywhere it says Montpelier, and it was almost the identical <laughs> presentation about the challenges facing the entire state. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the data, and talking to my colleagues, everyone's struggling with the same exact issue, with the possible exception of Chittenden County. But it's, 
the same shortages, the same costs, the same out of, out of state buyers. I mean, you name the issues, it's coming up everywhere. And so it, it really is a huge challenge. You know, I think some of ours are a little bit more exaggerated. On the other hand, we have maybe a little bit more demand. But yeah. it's really, we're not alone in this, folks. And, and it's, it's really, and so the solutions are very similar. But, the, you know, the one thing we've heard from people, and I've heard the last several years, and I think maybe here is that, you know, if, if the public, and I don't know if it's Montpelier or anywhere else, if we're not able to invest, like buying the Elks Club or putting in some of the things, you know, the old model of putting that all on the developer, un unless you want super high end, yeah. it just isn't going to happen because it, it can't work. I mean, for those, Ian might be the only one left, uh, Don, maybe when we were looking at housing at, at one Taylor Street, and it was originally going to be market, yeah. and, and Redstone just came to us and said, we cannot make this work. Yeah. We can't, you know, for the costs and everything else, he's the only people that can make this work is downstreet and, you know, an affordable housing group. And that's what we went with. So I, I think it's a huge challenge. And as we go forward, you know, we need to be thinking about how we can in, invest in housing and the, trans, you know, same with the transitional housing. The state's not going to do it all. So I urge us all to be, you know, if we think this is a huge issue, which of course it is, that we <coughs> we'd be willing to participate. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking today, I mean, the, the state has invested millions and millions of dollars in affordable housing. And, <coughs> you know, tens of thousands of units have been built. And we still, I mean, we have, we the situation is worse than ever. And I guess it just, it probably, if we did nothing, and if Montpelier had, had done nothing and didn't have the trust fund and didn't have, you know, housing-friendly zoning, and. Uh, it probably would be worse, but yeah. you, you know you can't really measure what might have been. They quoted he quoted a price of average price in the state of three hundred and sixty thousand dollars per unit to build yeah. cost to build. Wow. To build. Yeah. Yeah. For an apartment to, to develop to, to bring for a, any housing just a house yeah. a housing unit costs. So you know you look at the amount of money they've put in versus and they had an estimated shortage of I can't remember if you, you know, how many thousands state twenty thousand or something on you. You think, oh, that's attainable, and you look at how much money they put in divided by 360, and you're like, oh, yeah, no, yeah. it's going to be forever. Yeah. And that's just if the state were putting money in building housing. I do want to yeah. um, point out, so my husband works for Habitat for Humanity, Central Vermont. Um, his comment uh, was that, you know, for all the money that's been going uh, into housing from the state, a lot of it goes into rentals, and uh, home ownership is a way that a lot of Americans build equity, and uh, if people don't have access to home ownership, then they're being basically denied um, a main mechanism for building wealth uh, over time. Yeah. And so, anyway, that is, you know, when I when I think about the, you know housing that might go out on um, like the Elks Club, Elks Club property, if that's what we do, you know, I think about condos, you know. Things that are high efficiency but have a home ownership component to it. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd put that out there. Yeah. Um, I just want to yeah, have a one ahead. last comment too, because I wanted to support what what Polly just said. Was I asked specifically? You know, the, the, again, it was like, there's all this money. How do you, how do you get? It? And I said, well, how do how do the municipalities get it? And they said, you don't. It, there doesn't come. You have to go through a developer. You have to have a project. It has to be applied. There is not a direct. Hmm subsidy to that you know you have to partner with right. a, a, a housing provider so that was an interesting piece of information yeah 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 go ahead uh, Peter Kelman go ahead <coughs> uh, yeah Peter Kelman um, <laughs> uh, I, I I worked with Polly uh, on this report and uh, I think it does paint a, a very clear picture um, uh, when I moved to Montpelier six years ago, it, it just was not like that. The last six years, a lot has changed. What hasn't changed are two things. There's no one answer. There are, there are gonna have to be a bunch of different answers. There are gonna have to be answers that have to do with rental and answers that have to do with ownership. There are gonna have to be answers that have to do with low income, missing middle, and and the upper reaches as well. Luckily, we don't have to address those. Those will be addressed. But they will play a role. For example, in the Habitat Project, 
if you have lots that can be purchased by people who are going to build $500,000 houses, that brings money to the project so that you can build low, lower income projects. And the same thing could be done uh, uh, at, the, at the Elks Club. So it's gonna require uh, some real multi-purpose, multi-strategies, um, uh, and that's why we need a, a housing committee. Um, Polly did almost all that research herself. You need a committee where you have nine or, or 11, 10 people who are doing that research, who are doing working groups like the, the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, break down into working groups, and, oops, sorry, and tackle these different problems, come together and see how they can blend. So please, let's get that committee going. We need to get it going right away. You asked Polly some questions, she can't answer them. She's not, she's not even sure there's gonna be another meeting of the Housing Task Force, right? They typically take off July, there'll be one more meeting at least in June to say goodbye. So Bill, really, you gotta get that, that thing going. It hasn't been announced, it's listed on the website as the City Housing Committee or the Montpelier City, you look under H, it's not there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, Steve Whitaker again. Uh, I recommended months ago, six months ago, that the Homelessness Task Force be dissolved and merged into the Housing Committee. Uh, that was before this discussion of this, having an officially city-appointed Housing Committee. Uh, it's still a good idea, it just because there's emerg it'll be an emergency housing subcommittee of folks that are looking at the same developable parcels, temporary interim use of, for instance, the Home Farm Road project, which should be taken by eminent domain rather than let it be sold to Connor. Uh, that, that, that's an example that we, we can't continue. But here's the thing about attracting developers. Our, this is where our, our track record of mismanagement of our infrastructure repairs and our sidewalks and our uh, storm drains, the, the handicapped doors at the transit center still don't work. The three, three years later, the construction, the vinyl in the storm drains along the bike path is still there. So basically, the mismanagement that's been going on for so long discourages competent builders from coming here because they, they've seen the way we neglect our own infrastructure. So we've got some cleaning up to do, and I think it'll require new management uh, before we're gonna really get the kind of developer partners that, that we need to get this job done. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? And I actually am not in the Zoom. I don't see anybody else in the Zoom. Um, yes, Jack. Uh, thanks, Polly. Great report. I just wanted to mention for people who may not be aware of it that uh, we've studied a bunch of this stuff already, and uh, Polly and I were on a committee back in 2011 uh, looking at uh, barriers to new housing. And Polly and I were on it uh, from the Housing Task Force. Uh, council members Angela Timpone and Nancy Sherman were on it, and bunch of other people and uh, it's on the city's webpage and I would I, I would encourage people who are interested to look at it because it's uh, <coughs> all the factors are still there <laughs> and it's 11 years ago so one of the things that I worry about with that well, not, well with the barriers to housing in general is that it feels like the answer is that we can build our way out of this problem. And we have built more housing, but the problem still persists. And so I kind of, I wonder like how much housing would we need for it to really actually help? You know, we've, we've added, I mean, even since I've been on the council, we've added uh, quite a few units actually in, in the city. I feel like we, we knew at one point like how many units um, had been added, what would it take 
you know, and and you know if it's if it's some ghastly number, you know, well then what what do we do with that? Like, does that mean building up? in some places. I know that would be very scary for a, a lot of people in Montpelier, uh, but I guess it would be good to know like, really what, uh, what a, an actual solution would look like um, in that situation. Uh, yeah, Peter, I'll invite you up. Yeah, just because yeah. I think um, that's a great question. Let me yeah. just say, I think the number that we've, has been bandied about was 100 a year. Per year. That. It, yeah. Ending at what point? Do we? No, uh, we don't know. No, but that—that's that, just a number. But, but actually, and this is a very good point. The, it, it, it's not just a b building up. We have some huge houses that are owned by seniors that could be broken up into yeah. three or four units. We've got uh, places that could take a three or four-story uh, apartment unit, such as is being proposed for. The, uh, uh, the by the Boves and possibly if, if the motel came up for for sale uh, something could be put there so there are places that you could do that there are also there are also ways to get with greater density that's the reason why the density uh, I, I I would say that ultimately the the the, 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 the new committee will say we should uh, uh, raise density requirements to allow if, you know to allow like cluster housing, uh, the um, Isabel uh, uh, Circle purple. proposal has c cottage housing, and then it has lots around it that could be built by uh, private developers for more expensive houses. So again, lots of different solutions. I don't think barriers should be seen as, no, this, this, we're not going to be able to do this. Barriers are challenges to be figured out how to solve that problem. And the answer is always going to be answers. It really will be. Don't, don't get too fixated on any one answer. I, I really think that's the important okay. thing. Thank you, Peter. And I see Mike Miller, you've got your hand raised. Go ahead. I just, just want to go and answer your question. And it's when we did the math on uh, what well, we came on minimum um, obviously I don't know what the number will be but uh, it would have to be at least we need to add at least 240 housing units just to kind of get us out and, and that doesn't really reflect any any demand that might be you know unmet demand prices to stabilize you need vacancies around five percent and so that would be um, basically at least 240 units and, and very, very likely many more than that. So that we've always tried to target that sound like much, but it's actually a, a quite difficult. I mean, that's basically building a transit center every year. Um, and, you know, we've got another, a number of projects in the pipeline that if we can get them to start to come through, we would start to be making some reasonable dents into that number and then seeing where it gets us. But again, those were just basic number was at least 240. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. Um, I can just yes, follow up a little bit too. Um, the last time we did the community survey uh, in 2009, the question was posed, you know, do you support the construction of 500 new housing units over the next, it was either five or 10 years? And people overwhelmingly support it. So the council at that point had sort of set a 500 goal. I think if you take out some of what's been done, it's probably not quite 240. I mean, it's a little bit more, but I think those numbers are not totally inconsistent either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Any other thoughts or comments? Donna, go ahead. Well, I, I just haven't thanked you tonight, but <laughs> I really, really appreciate it. And I think you are our queen of housing. And even <laughs> if you're not on the committee, we will come and get you. <laughs> awesome. Thank, well, thank you. you so thank much, Thank you Paul. for your time and thank you for your interest. Absolutely. Well, and on a related note, um, the Housing Trust Fund recommendation, um, I feel like that one's pretty sure, straightforward, is, but do you want to explain it? This is from staff. Uh, I think Mike and or Josh will weigh in if necessary. But I um, mentioned this a little bit last time when we talked about forming the housing committee. Um, remind you that 
the, the original housing task force was actually a task force made up of providers. So it was the, the housing authority, downstreet, various people that were involved in, in provision of housing services. So when the housing trust fund was created to help fund projects, I think that the trust fund, I mean the task force themselves realized, hey, we shouldn't be the people making recommendations on these projects. And so a separate housing trust fund committee was created, some of whom overlap with task force members and some who don't. And that group really meets generally about once or twice a year to sort of put out the RFP for funding and then review their requests and make a recommendation for the council. And um, it's our recommendation, our staff recommendation that if that that group be disbanded and that be folded into this housing committee uh, and because it won't be a task force per se and if somebody is on it that is a potential applicant they can recuse themselves we do have an ethics policy but that in general it's meant to be a, a working committee and not only will that streamline things but it allows those people on the committee to get a first-hand look at what the you know what the requests for funding are, what the project needs, what the costs are, and I think it's an, it's an educational process as well. So, um, and if we just we just really don't need two separate groups if we're gonna if we're gonna fold this. So, the, the, to remind people that haven't gone through it, the housing task the trust fund puts out a request, they get the funds, they make a recommendation, but it still comes to the city council for final approval. So. And there have been times when the council didn't totally go along with the recommendation, but usually they do. Um, so they don't have any final authority to make decisions that still rests here. So we think it's a good idea to streamline this process. Um, obviously, both of these committees are formed by the council at the will of the council. Um, so it's not like you know, there's any, they don't have any legal standing other than your appointment of them. Jack. I support this idea. At, uh, we discussed this at our uh, housing task force meeting last week, and uh, there are really two alternatives that, uh, you know, I, I should say that I've served on the uh, Housing Trust Fund uh, Advisory Committee for years, and uh, there are two alternatives that we talked about doing. One was to uh, dispense with some kind of committee uh, review and just rely on staff coming to the city council and, and the council making the uh, decision based on staff's uh, proposals and the other was the proposal we have tonight and uh, my experience on the trust fund advisory committee is that uh, it is it has never been a rubber stamp for uh, for the proposals for the for the people who are coming in with uh, applications, and that we've always been uh, given scrutiny to the ideas, talked about uh, ways that the ideas could be made better, and uh, before making the final recommendations to the to the council, and so I think there's real value to having some kind of uh, committee review by people who uh, have made it their business to become expert in uh, in the field of housing in Montpelier, and so for that reason, I think we should uh, adopt the recommendation to assign this task to the. Uh, to the housing committee. And dissolve the housing trust fund committee. Yeah. Is that a motion? That is my motion. Okay. And I'll second it. Okay. Further discussion? Yes. Peter Kalman. Uh, I'm in favor of um, doing this, but the timing has to be done right. I urge you not to dissolve the housing trust fund until the new housing committee is actually operational and is ready to do it. I mean, I, I was on the uh, CJAC, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, when it started brand new. It took us six months from the time we were appointed 
to really get a committee that was operating. I, I, what happens if you guys need a, a recommendation next October? I, 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 I wonder whether the, 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 ha the housing committee is going to be ready by next October to take this on. So c can you just figure out a way to do this so that you get word from the housing committee, we're ready, and then dissolve it. Don't dissolve it now, because otherwise you may be fine. You're having the second option, which is staff just making the recommendations. Okay, thank you. And I just want to recognize that I am letting you speak multiple times because you're on the um, housing task force. This is a separate issue, okay? Yes, but. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Donna, yes. Uh, along with the agenda sheet on this, it talks about when effective, that the effect that the committee would new committee would be effective. Once it's there, then the other committee will dissolve. So it didn't put the date like today on it. Well, okay. That should be in there. Um, hey, so um, that's okay. Um, so does does that need to be stated in the motion? What do you think, Jack? I I'm happy to say that my motion includes that the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Committee would not be dissolved until the uh, membership of the um, Housing Committee is, is in place. Okay. And your agreement with that? Second. Okay. Okay. Um, further discussion? And not seeing anyone online. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and let's, um, I'll, I'm looking forward to hearing more from the housing committee. We're, we're, we're at all, <laughs> really. I'm looking forward to them existing. Um, all right, on to the public records fee policy. Um, shall I turn this over to you, Bill? Uh, yeah, and maybe I'll kick it right to Cameron if okay. I, she did most of the heavy lifting on this. Um, this is basically taking the statute <coughs> for public records and trying to formalize it into a policy. We get a lot of requests, and they come in. Uh, they, we have streamlined them by creating a public records request, but we're trying to uh, become even more efficient and clear about how they'll be handled. And we haven't really um, traditionally charged people, uh, but the, the state does allow it uh, to be done, and we've had some requests of late that have required a pretty uh, large amount of work to, to comply with, and the, the law allows us to assess fees. So that was our intent, was to follow the law as we have been and um, help defer costs when possible. So. My thunder. Um, <laughs> so, council, thank you for letting me come speak to you tonight. Um, I'm Assistant City Manager Cameron Niedermeyer. Uh, for folks who don't know me, um, so we put this policy together. I worked closely with our attorney. Um, what it really is, and it's our recommendation to take a policy that basically mirrors the law. The whole policy, if you read through it, it mirrors the law. It hopefully. I hope that I did a good job um, breaking down what that actually means so it's a little bit more relatable and understandable. It shows folks how we would be responding, who's responding, and where they need to direct their questions to. That's our biggest issue as staff, honestly, is that requests are coming in just to emails, to people who might not be in the office, to just folks. And I think on one hand, it's a, um, a really great sign that people feel comfortable and safe asking questions with staff, um, but it makes it very hard to track and respond to public records. So we're hoping that, um, you know, by putting a policy in place that we can very easily point to will help sort of streamline some of those requests coming in. The other part of this um, that might be a little bit more uh, heavy on the discussion is it does change sort of the um, uh, fees schedule slightly. Um, it does increase it very slightly from what the state has as their fee schedule. I'm hoping you'd be interested in adopting this schedule, which is just slightly separate from theirs, to uh, where we discussed it as it um, 
not as a deterrent, but as a realistic understanding of how much paper and equipment costs these days if we're making large uh, um, printing projects, et cetera. Most of our requests are not for print, so I don't anticipate this being super impactful to folks. Most people want digital copies um, because that is the way that most of our data is stored or most of our records are stored is digitally. Can I ask um, a question? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> in that this schedule differs slightly from the state's schedule, mm -hmm. Um, we are allowed to do that. Yes. Okay. So this is the process of, by which uh, councils are allowed to make their own fee schedule. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so the only uh, thing that I, I think is important for to communicate to the public is that a lot of the things that we do during the day and we respond to requests are technically us creating records for people. We do that, I think, pretty frequently. What it becomes difficult is, is when we're compiling and creating data for people um, that takes a long time. And so we are running into that issue as staff. It is really eating into our capacity time, uh, thus the really just making it very clear that the law does give us the authority to charge. If y'all are not interested in this fee schedule, um, I would ask that, um, we do adopt the state's fee schedule, if you're not interested in, in this one, um, uh, because I, I think it is very important that we recognize we do have the ability to do that by state law, and that it would be very helpful to have the support from s city council to just say, hey, they have the authority to do this, they might could ask um, for, for funding if the project is is large enough. Um, I also want to make sure that the public understands that if you do ask us to make a record, um, we will look at it, we'll see what it would take, and we would let you know beforehand, before we did any work, if it would cost anything so that we're not putting you out um, that way. Okay. Cool. Is that it? Um, <laughs> yes. Okay, great. <laughs> No, no. Oh, I, th I think that's Chief's radio. Yeah. Oh, okay, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes, go ahead, Carrie. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking about the difference My, between... Sorry, thinking about the difference between providing a copy of a record and um, providing access for inspection of records. Mm -hmm. And so it's... Um, am I correct that we are allowed to charge for providing copies of records or making new records, but we're not allowed to charge for allowing inspection of Correct. records. Okay. Correct, and wh where that really comes in is when somebody wants, so if it's just taking a digital copy of a record and emailing it, there's no cost to produce that. Uh, if, if a record, if someone wants photocopies of a file or wants them you know, sent out or coal turned into something else, searchable PDFs or something like that. That's a that's a record we don't have, and right. so there's a cost to create that, and so we would, uh, you know, seek payment. But they're also welcome to look at if they don't want to do that. They're welcome to look at the file itself, and there's there's no charge for that unless yeah, there's no charge for that. Um, it, but it's, the, the real thing is creating the records, and that is I think some people, you know. If, we, if a record exists, we're required to provide it, but sometimes people want us to do some, you know, I want to know this compared to, the, you know, the, uh, some analysis. And technically, we don't have to do it at all. We're, we try to comply, you know, if we do it and it takes some time, then people need to know it. And, and we don't want to get into this thing where sometimes we do it and sometimes we don't, or sometimes we charge and sometimes we don't. So we want to be very clear in the policy about that. Thank you, Bill. Jack. I think what Bill said uh, is a very good point. I think the people don't always recognize that this is a statute that doesn't allow for production of information, it's production of documents. And those are two different things. Um, I, I think this is a, a good thing to, uh, to go forward with. Um, I've certainly heard that it can be quite burdensome and uh, divert uh, city employees from other duties to respond to, uh, to re public records requests. Um, I have one question that uh, we may want to address in the uh, 
in the document, and and I haven't I haven't read through this that many times, so I'm not, but I think I'm right about this. In the third page, um, under copies of public records, charges, it's uh, it's permissive except where otherwise provided by law. The custodian may charge and collect the following uh, costs, and then the costs are listed. And um, I wonder if we want to have a provision in the policy that says that uh, charges would be uh, applied uniformity and uh, without uniformly and without discrimination with regard to the person who's requesting it or the use for which it's uh, being requested because uh, I think we want to be absolutely clear that the city is going to treat everyone who requests copies fairly and uh, equally. That's a good suggestion. <clears throat> Donna. Just one piece of that. You're not even allowed to ask why they want them. So would that need to be stated as far as the purpose? You mentioned. No, I don't think so. In fact, I think we could. Uh, That's what I heard you say that. Yeah, I. Okay. I was just thinking that I can imagine, you know, there are, there are these web pages that uh, that like to collect uh, mug shots of people. I just post post mug shots <coughs> of anyone who's arrested up on the web page because I think you know celebrities, people are are some people take pleasure in the suffering of others, and so they see people who are arrested and they like to do that and so that's a commercial activity and uh, and even if it's a commercial activity we don't want to we, we can't say well we're treating you differently because it's a commercial activity so that might uh, be addressed simply by uh, changing the word may to shall and um, shall without discrimination as to the uh, requester. Something like that. We, we would want to play around with the language, but that's, uh, that's the, my thinking. Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree very strongly with that suggestion. And um, uh, that was sort of my understanding of what this policy was setting out to do, was to say this is how we are going to handle public records requests. And so I think it might just be a matter of changing may to will or shall, and <clears throat> that could be it right there, um, saying this is what we do. This is our policy. If you request records, this is the fee schedule. This is how it works. And I would like to, I would like to see that so that it's not left to the discretion of whoever's providing the records. Um, Jack, do you have a specific place where you could see a may turning into a shell? Yes, on page three <coughs> under um, copies of public records, uh, line one, charges. It says the custodian may charge and collect. I would change the may to shall. Oh, okay, right there. And uh, there may not be any other place like that. Okay. Just question on that, I, so I generally get that and understand it. Do you want to set a, a minimum, like if, if the fee is like at least a dollar? <laughs> I say that because we often have someone coming in, they're, they're looking at a Lister card, you know, an assessor's card, they make a, fo a single photocopy that's a 10 cent copy and they may not have a dime with them and we, you know, the, it, it seems, you know, but I would say maybe if we say uh, for any, total accumulated fee above a dollar, we shall do that. I think there ought to be some discretion for a single copy type yeah. thing. We don't, I, like you said, we don't get many of them anymore, but we used to, and it was, you know, we'd ask people for dimes, and they would just be like, I don't have one, and I'm like, okay, well, there you go. Yep. take your copy. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, for, for billing for time, we have, uh, right. the, it doesn't start until 30 minutes, right. so the first 30 minutes are free. And, and that's so in statute. Yeah, and so I would even suggest five dollars or ten dollars rather than a dollar, because you know 
you can think about what uh, <coughs> makes sense given the vo uh, volume of the requests that you're getting, but uh, if you're collecting a lot of dollar bills, that may be right. more effort than it's worth. Yeah, we're getting, I mean, we're getting almost no requests these days in, in that sort of middle, the photocopies, CD type thing, or it's very rare. Um, but the, the real request is the amount of time it takes to seek, search, Create and records, in fact, yeah. in many cases now, we're actually paying a third party to do the searches because we, you know, we use our, our technical search, so, and we're not even allowed to necessarily to charge that direct cost, so. So, uh, did we land on, uh, you, you know, number? after, after <laughs> five dollars? Okay. Any other comments from council? The only um, the only hesitation that I have yeah. with five dollars, if I can have a pushback on that, yeah. is yeah. that um, some of the things that cost physical money. Um, like the CDs and stuff. It's not like we have a huge stack of these things on hand and we wouldn't be paid to purchase the thing. So um, that's really where that fee came from is me assessing costs of the things and how I would get them if people want it. So maybe a dollar sounds great to me because a lot of the, the more daily activities are not reaching that threshold. But some of the things that would require us to go spend money do hit that threshold. So like, <clears throat> so you'd be more in favor of a dollar being the threshold? I would be. Is so saying something like, except where otherwise provided by law, <coughs> the custodian shall charge and collect the following costs for making a public record for any public record that costs more than a dollar. That sounds okay to me, yeah. yeah. Um, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, th I think overall, I like, having a policy and I like having it be consistently applied. Um, <coughs> definitely want to err towards, you know, our values of access. These are public records, making sure that, um, you know, everyone can get what they need. I guess I, two questions I had. One was um, if there are other communities, so legally um, we're allowed to go above and beyond. Have other communities done this? Is co this consistent with what any other communities are charging for the fee schedule? Um, and I was just curious, um, like, how many are going beyond 30 minutes? Is that the right threshold? Um, is that, where did that number come from as opposed to an hour or some other number? Um, it tracks the law. So that's actually in statute is the 30 minutes. Um, I did not do any benchmarking outside of what our legal um, representation told me. Um, he gave me a few examples of other communities that do charge a little more, but they were uh, probably not, they weren't Vermont. So, so and, and just to weigh in on that, the, the city's ability to charge fees that um, still have to re reflect real cost. You can't just charge a fee because you want to charge a fee, so it has to reflect the actual, you, you, you can't mark up on those kinds of things. So the fees were tempted to, you know, a CD costs a dollar, that's what it costs, you know, the average cost loaded for, you know, $60 an hour for an employee at a dollar a minute. With benefits, that's a, a real cost. So we can't say, oh, we're gonna charge $5 a minute because we just want to. So, so the law requires us to make sure that it reflects actual cost. So that's what this was meant to look at. So I d we didn't really look, you know, different communities could have different actual costs. Okay. And anything? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't love if we're the state, the city, town, community in Vermont that's the most expensive to access public records in. Um, I. I mean, I uh, understand where this is coming from, and I just personally want to err towards access and affordable. I mean, with so the equity to be committee clear, lens, like this right. seems like it could become certain people can access records now and other people can't. Right. I so to be clear, we are not um, we're not seeking to to run this up. We are trying to reflect actual costs. Uh, this is your policy and your priority, so I mean, if you want to go with the state fees, I mean, we don't have any, there's no ill, you know, it's fine with us, you know, we just thought you should see what our estimate of actual costs for these were. 
Um, and I think you had. Uh, or if you don't <coughs> want to charge fees, I mean that is also your policy decision. I want to be clear about that. The state right. allows this, and um, but we, we are getting a lot of them, and they are very. Uh, some of them are very time-consuming and um, distracting. Um, and Lauren, to answer your question about how many we're getting, right? I I can say pretty. Uh, I, I would say a lot of our leadership team uh, spends a good a percentage of their week responding to public records requests in some variety. I don't think all of them rise to the level of actually charging. I think we get a few that take a good amount of time, and those are the ones that um, I think a policy are really important for um, because a lot of the analysis is what they're asking for, not the um, actual records. We've never denied anyone ability to come and look at things. It's um, taking things out of different databases and combining them and giving that kind of information is what really takes the time um, and what we would be, you know, uh, being more um, consistent about charging for. Or, for example, a, a, a request that wants to go back two or three years, all communications for two or three years, so we have to have them all sorted. Mm -hmm. And then the key person, usually me or whoever's involved, has to then go through all of them to figure out which ones are relevant and which ones aren't, sort them, do all that, see if there's any exemptions. Oh, we don't usually claim that many and then present them. So that, you know, that takes a lot of time. And uh, you know, a lot of our requests are just, I want a copy of a police report for my insurance, and those, kind of, and those go really quickly. But you know, over half, I'd say, really just come from one place, and they're often very long and not very um, kind of vague, so it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Any other questions from council? Okay. Um, comments from the public? Um, yeah, I think I am uh, Steve Whitaker. A significant requester of public records that's what happens when you uh, manage things or mismanage things in a manner that requires a lot of accountability and transparency um, I was quoted $769 to get copies of videos of the meetings that we were required by law to record during the pandemic I'm not sure you're aware of that but that's that type of storage management operation by the courts have been interpreted to be an incentive to not provide, a disincentive to provide records by storing them improperly. You know, if we've recorded Zoom recordings, they should be on a hard drive somewhere that you can say, here's the link, download what you want. You know, but to, to abuse the statute to suggest that I have to pay $700 to watch the meetings where the public business was being done to have a copy of them because I don't have the broadband capability to watch them in real time or stream them. The statute explicitly says the requester can inspect or request a copy. So there's no distinction there. What's attempting is saying it's good enough that you get to stream it if you have good enough broadband. Obviously, Mike Miller didn't have good enough broadband tonight. Um, so that's, that's a key point. Also, Montpelier is unusual in that we outsource both our IT and our legal, which increases the cost uh, that you're going to attempt to shoulder on. This is too late and too big of an issue to be adopted tonight. This is something that you really need to inform the public of how it's going to impact, which includes understanding the kind of stuff I'm going to tell you and d debating it publicly, not just ramming it through like you did. Yeah, sh shut the, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you think uh, this is simple enough to adopt, uh, I'd be happy to pillory it. Um, who's, who's $2 a minute? Who's, who's worth $2 a minute? Who gets that besides Bill Frazier? That's absurd, you know? Um, I've asked recently for the water billing data. I was told Sarita can export the data set. A, a database is a record. It's not just documents, Jack. It's a record can be a database. So the entire database of the water billing, including the legend of what's in what field, 
is a requestable record and it only takes minutes to export. But instead, they're sending me six different PDFs that, you know, cannot be imported into a spreadsheet to be analyzed. It's a lot of game playing. This, your staff is basically obstructing transparency into the water billing anomalies that people are complaining about. So uh, CDs and DVDs, flash drives, if we're gonna adopt this state schedule, it should be updated to request to to reflect the current cost of CDs and DVDs and at Steve, thumb drives. you're at three minutes now, so if you could wrap up your comments. No, I just think your, your prejudicial, you know, arbitrary and unequal tr treatment of my comments versus anybody else who spoke tonight is really an insult and, again, a disqualification from the Senate. So I don't think that that is accurate, but thank you for um, wrapping that up. Um, any other comments? Mayor, I just didn't know if you wanted me to address any of that. If you would like to, yes. Um, I do want to make it clear to residents, I think, that no one is trying to keep anything from folks. Um, Mr. Whitaker's request for um, information, if he wanted to see the videos, they were, he was more than welcome to come and inspect them at any time. We gave him ample opportunity to come in and see those records. Um, he was asking for a record creation he wanted a database that we don't have and we don't keep because we're not required to. So uh, we declined creating a new record unless he wanted to pay for the time, but he's able to come and watch videos anytime in City Hall if he wants to, and that offer still stands. So um, please do not hesitate to reach out. If you have any questions about information that you want, we can work with anyone to help get you what you need. Okay. Thank you, Thank Cameron. You. Uh, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. Um, if somebody needs something on a CD, flash drive, or whatever media, why don't they just bring it themselves? Bring the CD, flash drive, whatever media that they want it on and put it on themselves. They can do if that. You've got a, if you've got a computer that, if somebody, is there a computer? Would there be a computer at City Hall if I came down and said, I'd like to watch this video. Would there be a computer there that I could see it on? Yes, we would accommodate that for you, Vicki. Also, and you... in that case, I can download that to my CD. Yes. And leave. If it has a CD drive. Well, uh, the, yeah, this, this might not actually whatever. accommodate that, but yes. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know? Yes. I mean, bring my, bring my own uh, portable CD drive. Yes. Okay, um, thanks. I, I just, uh, thank you, Vicki, uh, for that. That's a good point. Um, I just want to note, I have a little bit of hesitancy around people just bringing their own USB drives. Yeah, that's fair. That's Probably shouldn't stick random shouldn't USB drives in uh, computers. That. Yeah, yeah, yep. so just noting that. <laughs> thank you. Yep, no problem. Um, any Maybe if they brought a brand oh, new so one still Vicky, in the package. So, <laughs> uh, thank you, okay. Uh, all right, I think that is it. Um, is there a motion? This was a, tried to sort of write down what you said. So hopefully that. Yeah, for any record that costs more than a dollar. And then the word changed to shall. Do you mean like any cumulative? That cost? cumulatively costs. I like that you guys get to watch me try to spell things. <laughs> is that is that a fair addition? Mm -hmm. no, no judgment. It's all good. Shh, shh, shh. It'll <laughs> it'll fix. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, I'll make the motion that we approve the public record inspection copying transmission policy as edited. Okay, motion and a second. Further discussion? Connor. Yeah, I, I don't know if it needs to be in the motion or anything, but if we could just maybe like set a time that we would get an update on, you know, what we're doing, whether it be six months or something. Um, I'd just like to get a snapshot of that in case we decide to adjust it again. Sure. Why we, yes. Why don't, we, why don't we do that during budget? Yeah, right. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I. It sounds like we're moving ahead with it as is. Um, so yeah, I would very much just 
an understanding kind of who it's impacting? Is it creating any barriers for some folks in the community to access records? Um, and kind of how many people are now paying for records? Like, I like the idea of the consistency of shall so that there's not discretion, but I could see where some discretion and judgment might sometimes be a valuable tool to have for city staff. So I could see that creating some issues. So it'd be helpful to know kind of how it's playing out on the ground. Sure. Okay. All right. There's been a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Uh, great. So we are done with our regular business. So we're going to move on to council reports. I am a creature of habit. Uh, Donna, are you okay to go first? I'm just going to say that it, I'm looking forward to June. <laughs> I, I'm hoping they'll have steady, reasonable weather. <laughs> Everybody enjoy themselves. Yeah. We have a holiday coming. Yeah, absolutely. Carrie, go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of um, touch back again on the, uh, the gun violence issue and the, the recent experience that um, our, our public school system has had. And um, just that uh, in, in this particular incident, this, this um, potential threat in uh, Montpelier School, and then there was another one in a different school system a few years ago here in Vermont, where both were stopped before anything happened because p other people who heard things or uh, saw things spoke up and, um, and brought it to, uh, to attention. And I just want to uh, thank the folks who have done that and to um, ask us all to remember that we need to really be looking out for each other and really be paying attention to each other and really um, uh, we, we do need more sensible gun safety laws, absolutely. We also need a culture that recognizes people's humanity and um, connection and uh, because there's a much bigger cultural issue that we have that's resulting in this gun violence. So that's all. Yeah, great, thank you. Connor, go ahead. That's uh, w well said and uh, along the same lines, um, you know, I think a lot of people are feeling kind of helpless, hopeless. Um, so gun sense and moms demand action will be at the farmer's market this weekend table in a bit. Um, there are ways we can, you know, plug people into a way where they feel like they're doing something. Um, rather than just sitting back and waiting for the next thing to happen. I, I was thinking a lot about a quote. There's a Mother Jones quote that, uh, you know, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. And I think it's pretty applicable to something like this. That's, that's how we do honor people. So thank you. And we, if anybody wants to join us um, th this weekend, it would be great. great. I'm Jack. I think I'll pass tonight. Okay. Great. Lauren. Um, Two just thoughts for future agendas. Um, one, public restroom was brought up earlier. I do wonder about, I know we'd been having conversations with, um, you know, about could the state partner with us in this? And now that the legislature's gone, so uh, whatever <laughs> opportunity there. Um, <clears throat> so it would be great. I think I'm on that committee, happy to meet whenever. <laughs> um, so it would be great to just get that going now that, that we have a better sense of what happened with the state. And just in that vein, I was wondering about if it's worth inviting our legislators or at least some of them to come give us an update on what passed, um, what kind of the things on our legislative agenda, um, and speaking to funding opportunities, things in the budget that we should be aware of as a city, just kind of get that overview. We've got some people with a real finger on the pulse of the money in particular. Um, so I was thinking about that. And yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Great. Um, I just also want to circle back to the uh, issue of gun violence and uh, just recognize also that um, people are um, in, a, I think, in our community even in a lot of um, pain and just really frustrated and um, and looking for some answers right now. And I, I do hope that people turn uh, this uh, uh, sense, you know, the, the feelings that folks are, are having right now turned into action in terms of getting in touch with legislators, um, getting educated on the, the universe of um, 
kinds of common sense gun safety legislation that uh, can be enacted and uh, just to hope that um, that is that's helpful as a way to um, to honor the dead um, so uh, with that um, I think I will um, be done um, John I'll just mention that a gentleman from the American Legion came in today and asked me to sing the national anthem to kick off the Memorial Day festivities this time around. So I will be singing. That's great. All right, and Bill. I just have one quick thing. Um, You may recall at the last meeting we set our summer schedule and we talked about needing a special call-in meeting to set the tax rate. And we'd um, tentatively pencil that in on Wednesday the 13th. Wondering if we could do that sometime on Monday the 11th. That works best with our schedule. It literally should be, you know, it's a math calculation, but you have to vote to set it. So it should be very short meeting. We'd be call in only or. So you said July 11th? July 11th, yes. It's a Monday. And, oh. it, instead of the Wednesday the 13th, if we could do it on Monday the 11th, it would just, um, Kelly asked if we could do that, it would help speed up. Yeah. You know, it's going to be, it, because of the. Anyway, yes, it'll, it'll fit Are our schedule. Are we thinking like noon? It could be whatever time of day works. Uh, we could do it noon. We could do it whenever. Um, it really, like I said, shouldn't take a long period of time. We really only need four people. But I just, we had said potentially the 13th for this, and I um, just wanted to change it. So. Yeah. Um, how does noon work for folks? Noon. Yeah. Monday I'm seeing noon. Th- a lot of thumbs up. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Beautiful. Um, Beautiful. That's all I have. Tax rate meeting. Okay. Got that in my calendar. Um, I'll send it out too. Okay. I think that is it. So without objection, we will consider the meeting adjourned. 10 11. Whew.